Walter's trolling me? Maybe. So, return from Subway World second time. So we're at Subway World 2, which is the start of the second half of the game, uh, where you're escorting Eileen through all the same areas, all the same worlds that you've already gone through as Henry. Uh, but now you have to try to get through all of those worlds with Eileen, and Eileen cannot use ladders. So kind of makes the worlds <laughs> on the one hand it kind of sucks because you're just repeating all these same areas on the other hand you kind of have a new s sort of set of puzzles for for getting through each of those uh each of those worlds again because you've got to figure out how to do it and get eileen through each area without being able to use any ladders so you kind of have to revisit everything and Unlock things differently. Do some, some new work. But uh, story so far. Story so far. So up to this point, this game is about a man named Walter Sullivan who was born in a, an apartment, specifically uh, South Ashfield Heights, in room 302, where he was immediately abandoned by his parents. Uh, as a newborn, the superintendent of the apartments uh, found him shortly after his birth, um, took his umbilical cord and kept it, and then had him uh, taken to, you know, taken by the uh, the authorities, where he eventually became an orphan that wound up in uh, an orphanage called Wish House. And Wish House is an orphanage just on the outskirts of Silent Hill that is run by the Order, by the cult of Silent Hill. Walter, as an orphan, was raised in that orphanage and made to believe that Room 302, or he ha already had the belief that Room 302, the apartment that he was born in, was his actual mother. So, the cultists, specifically Dahlia Gillespie, brainwashes Walter and tells him, if you read this and perform this particular ritual of ours, you can be reunited with your mother. So, that particular ritual that Walter is raised believing will reunite him and his mother is called the 21 Sacraments. And the 21 Sacraments basically involves killing 20 victims along with Walter himself as sacrifices in order to bring about one of the cult's gods. It's supposed to summon a god. Walter is led to believe that it's just going to reunite him with his mother. So he's sort of brainwashed and, and lied to by the cult into performing this ritual, to making his whole life about completing this ritual. So Walter kills his first 10 victims out of 21, uh, which is the first half of the ritual, and then kills himself. Um... He himself is the 11th victim necessary for the sacrifice. He has to kill himself in order to shed his physical form and basically become a ghost with the powers of Silent Hill, essentially. He, Walter basically has the powers of the town where he can take things that are from his own mind and create alternate realities, his own worlds, using those memories. So then after the 11th, you know, victim, Walter taking his own life, there were victims 12 through 15 had been killed a few months apart after that point. And during that time, there was a man named Joseph Schreiber who was at that point living in room 302 
the room where Walter had been born many years ago at that point, who had been researching Walter, he'd been researching the cult, he'd been researching Silent Hill and publishing articles about it, and he himself winds up becoming a victim of Walter, one of the 21 sacraments. A couple years after Joseph's death, a man named Henry Townsend moves into room 302, and after living there for a couple of years and there being weird stuff going on in the apartment the entire time, he finally gets to a point where he cannot escape his room, and that is the start of the game. Henry is trapped in room 302, and Walter is still performing the 21 sacraments. He still has victims number 16 through 21 to go. So we've already seen... Uh, all, most of those victims up to this point. In the first half of the game, we're going back and forth between Henry's room, room 302, and various worlds created by Walter. Subway world, forest world. Uh, so the subway that Walter would take as a child to get back and forth between the orphanage and room 302. Um, that subway is important to him, so... He creates a world around it, which is where Henry meets Cynthia. Cynthia winds up becoming victim number 16. After this, Henry goes to Forest World, which is the woods just outside the Wish House Orphanage. And you meet Jasper. Jasper is a sort of fan of the occult. He's not a member of the cult or anything like that. He's just one of those weird people who likes cults and stuff. I'm sure a lot of us as Silent Hill fans can relate. So he's basically a fanboy. He winds up going and exploring Silent Hill with friends and getting too close to the orphanage and winds up becoming a victim of Walter as well. Uh, so Jasper becomes victim 17. After this is uh, the water prison world, which is a, a cylindrical prison that the cult kept children in uh, if they were not doing what the cult wanted them to do. If they refused to believe in the cult's beliefs and, you know, dedicate themselves to performing these rituals, they would wind up in this prison. And Walter wound up in that prison more than once as a child before, you know, eventually becoming brainwashed into and, and essentially forced into performing the 21 sacraments. Uh, and inside that prison, Henry meets Andrew, Andrew DeSalvo, and Andrew was one of the guards who worked for the cult uh, and kept an eye on the children in the prison, who was also abusive towards them, uh, and Walter especially. So Andrew uh, winds up becoming victim number 18. After this, uh, Henry goes back through the room and into the hole again and goes into Walter's next world, which is the building world, which is the, sur the buildings uh, sort of surrounding South Ashfield Heights. There's all of these different stores. There's like a, a pet store, a bar, um, a sporting goods store, like all these different buildings that are in the area. And uh, one of Walter's previous victims had actually been like the pet store owner, um, the bar owner. Those were uh, a few of his victims in the first half of the 21 sacraments. And here in Building World, Henry encounters his neighbor, Richard Braintree. Braintree had been another person living in South Ashfield Heights for several years. He was around when Walter Sullivan was born and the subsequent years where Walter was returning to room 302 uh, as a child and then as a young adult. Um, so he recognizes Walter when he sees like little Walter running around in building world. Um, and Braintree was often, you know, seen yelling and scaring Walter away from the apartment building just because Richard Braintree is kind of a dick. And uh, Braintree winds up becoming... Victim number 19. So with only victims number 20 and victims number 21 left, 
we're now at this point where Eileen is victim 20 and Henry himself is supposed to be victim number 21. When Walter creates his next world, which is apartment world, basically his version of the South Ashfield Heights apartments themselves, he makes his move and attacks Eileen, but the young Walter, which sort of represents the last little bit of innocence or even good that was inside Walter before his brainwashing and dedicating his life to this horrible, you know, ritual involving murder, you know, killing 20 people. Um, that That last bit of innocence in the form of young Walter stops himself. He stops Walter from completely killing Eileen, but Eileen is still in really, really bad condition and taken to St. Jerome's Hospital. Uh, because of this, a world is created. Walter creates another world, uh, the hospital world, since that was also the hospital that Walter was taken to after uh, being born in South Ashfield Heights, because it's the closest hospital to the apartments. So Walter has memories of this hospital as well, creates a world around it, and Henry goes and discovers that Eileen is now in Walter's worlds as well. Um, Henry receives a note upon returning to his room. He tries to bring Eileen back to room 302 through the holes that he's been using to get from world to world. And Eileen doesn't see the hole. She doesn't have any way to go back to room 302 with Henry. Um, but upon returning to his room, Henry does find a note left behind by the ghost of Joseph, Joseph Schreiber, the previous tenant, and the journalist. And Joseph tells him to go down to the deepest part of him, meaning to just go back through all of the worlds that Walter has created and get to the point that is the most important to Walter. Uh, to go down to the deepest part of him and to discover the one truth. The one truth is literally a, a boss manifestation um, that we'll be getting to. So the point of the game now is basically, and as far as the lore goes, we have to get Eileen through each of Walter's worlds in order to get down to the deepest part of him and try to find a way to defeat him should be able to beat him now. And that's where we're at. That didn't take quite as long to explain as I thought it would. So at this point, we've already gone back to the subway world again. And we are trying to get Eileen through this uh, messed up world of Walters. And just like that, we're back in. Oh, right. So I'm hanging on to the shabby doll because I wanted to see if the haunting will happen if we just have this or if it's necessary to drop it into the inventory box. I think it does need to be in the inventory box for the haunting to start, but we'll see. Um, we've got our tokens. We've got the best weapon in the game, the paper cutting knife. And we've got our clean coin that we can go back and use in the vending machine. Always love that part of the story. We have to go down to the deepest part of him. Cool, sounds legit. Yeah, that's that's kind of the funny thing, is like, Henry Henry is such a clueless guy. Like, he, uh, he, he wakes up and he doesn't know what the sound of an ambulance siren is. 
He, lo- he sees six boxes of dog food, and he's like, that's enough cat food to feed an army of cats. Henry is, like, not the smartest guy. He's not all there. And, um... He manages to read this, like, note from Joseph that says, you know, very vague, go down to the deepest part of him, find the one truth. And he just knows what that means. And then explains it exactly like that to Eileen, and Eileen is 100% willing to just go along with it. Like, okay, let's do that. Void if red. Thank you so much for the three months. Come on, Eileen. Thank you so much. Very much appreciate the resub. Thank you, thank you. This came out of that vending machine. Murder scene key. We're gonna need that. Why are you breathing heavy? This looks like the station closest to our apartment. It is. Good job. Very smart. How did Walter choose his victims? Did they have to live in the same apartment, basically? No, it's not all people who live in the apartment. They're just people who have fit certain themes involved in the ritual um, that Walter has encountered in his life. Some of them were members of the cult. Some of them were people who lived in the apartment where he was born. Some of them are people who he knew from, you know, going back and forth between the orphanage and the uh, apartment. Because in the case of, like, Jasper, he was just a fanboy who got too close to the town and too close to Walter and his ritual, so he kind of got in the way. And became a victim. is left behind. Yeah, she's she's going to be by herself for a little bit. This is where I left off before. I was trying to clear these out. Because we're going to need to bring Eileen through this escalator. So it helps to clear out one side of these wallmen. Definitely easier to do this with things other than the paper cutting knife. But I'm committed. I'm committed to it.
Henry sometimes. I'm like, what? How are you missing? How are you, like, not locking on to a thing right in front of you? That it? Thought there was more? Nope, that's it. We got one side clear. Oh fuck, that's right, there's dogs and shit. Uh nope. Okay, so we're gonna need this Cynthia's commuter ticket. Now we can get back and forth between both sides of the subway. Cynthia's murder scene key. What's a train handle doing here? So we're going to be able to move the train on the king line. Nothing to say about this room being covered in Cynthia's blood. All right. Hey, Baraskinov. Hey, Bowie. Wondering what the enemies represent in Silent Hill 4. Maybe they don't represent anything and the team just made up enemies for each area. Well, some of them have pretty direct, like, connotations as to what they're supposed to be or or represent. So, for example, the tremors, the, the slugs that first show up in the water prison area. Andrew DeSalvo would put slugs and other insects into the drinking water given to the children, to the prisoners, which would have included Walter. Like, we find notes and stuff later where they talk about uh, Andrew putting, you know, slugs or putting black things in the water and stuff like that. So those are, like, a very, very direct thing. The twin victims are specifically two victims of Walter Sullivan's. Uh, those represent Billy and Miriam Locaine, who are the only two of Walter's victims that show up as a recurring sort of regular enemy instead of ghosts, um, which we talked about that last stream, but no idea if that is because they were children, they didn't or couldn't represent them as ghosts because um, they had some issues with, you know, childlike enemies with uh, Silent Hill 1. So this might have been... Something to to avoid that, or maybe they just have some other reasoning behind it. But some of them are a little bit harder to to kind of parse out what they might mean, like the the sniffer dogs. I'm not sure uh, what exactly the dogs might represent. Because with, like, Silent Hill 1, the dogs are around because we find out that Alessa herself was, like, scared of dogs. But was Walter scared of dogs? I don't know if that's ever mentioned in anything anywhere. Let's go, Eileen. You're scared of dogs, so they put them in. They're there specifically for you, Waddle. <laughs> Guess no one's scared of cats in the Silent Hill games? Should be. He should be. Oops, sorry, Eileen. Come on, Eileen. Oh, I swear, well, I mean. Let's go. 
This is one of the only parts of the game where you don't actually need to wait for Eileen to uh, to get to the bottom of the escalator. She doesn't have to be too close to go to the next area. You can just run all the way down and she'll she'll make it down there. The escalator will bring her down. It's fine. It, pretty much. See? And there she is. Um, oh, and of course, like a million ghosts here. All the ghosts are here. Cynthia's ghost is going to be right here on the train. And I am very close to dying. Let's just move the train... Use the handle. Car moved one car length. Come on. Let's get out of here. We can grab another sword of obedience here. And now we get another layer of difficulty. As if it wasn't bad enough that there's ghosts chasing you. And you've got to get Eileen through all these areas where she can't use ladders. Now Walter himself is also chasing you. He's right there. And we have these interesting areas sort of connecting Walter's worlds. These spirals, these elevators going back and forth. And a lot of creepy imagery. This is just horrible. Isn't it? Isn't it just? Two people on their knees with like a very large figure in between them. Hey, Maria. Hey, filthy bear. I'm sorry to hear that. Hopefully your nephew recovers. Sometimes cats and people aren't always uh, compatible, especially with babies or kids. Head body and all these rooms have that same sort of like hospital room texture. Actually, before I continue on to the next world, oh look at that! It's also a giant moth over there. So I've mentioned um, this during Silent Hill 2 playthroughs, where butterflies and moths, a lot of times, represent uh, reincarnation and rebirth. whole idea of like a caterpillar going into a cocoon being reborn as a butterfly look at that big old moth hanging out over there that's one of those things that on the original like if I wasn't playing this on PCSX2 with like widescreen POV mods and stuff like that the original PS2 version a lot of this stuff is 
almost impossible to see. Henry, you're going too fast. I'm like right here. What are you talking about? Okay, okay, all right, I'm dying, I'm dying. We've got a good haunting. That's one of the ones that's missing in the PC version, I believe. We got little Walter in the closet, little shadow Walter in the closet crying. Um, we are gonna need a sort of obedience for this place, uh, but not quite yet. I have 107 bullets. Let's use the pistol for for a little while. Should be able to reload that here. Here we go. Heal up. Let's go ahead and use a health drink as well. Just to top off. Nothing going on out there. From this point, I think any time we try and look at Eileen's room, all we're going to see is, uh, yeah, Robbie. Robbie just sitting there and pointing, judging. Any new dialogue about the room? I think he doesn't even talk about the food anymore. The water works, but I've got nothing to wash. Nothing in the fridge right now, but there is a haunting that we'll probably see. Return from below Subway World. Just static there. Oh, did I actually have a medallion or a candle? Because that haunting, the little Walter haunting in the bedroom is honestly one of the most dangerous ones. Because at this point, you don't heal when you come back to your room. So a lot of times, if you're playing this kind of the way I tend to, you'll stash your healing items, you'll come back to your room and heal when you need to. Um... Because you kind of have to keep your, your inventory clean in this game a lot more than the others, since you've got your limited inventory. Damn, I don't. Um, so, if you are really, really hurt, like if you just barely survive getting to a, a hole to come back to the room, you wake up in the bed, and the Shadow Walter haunting is right there next to the bed, you can take damage before you're able to move away from it unless you're really lucky and really fast and if you're already really low health you can kind of get stuck to a point where like you can't come back to the room because you come back and just wake up in the bed and don't have enough health to survive the haunting and just die over and over
Hey, Pythonicus. Hope you're doing well tonight, man. All right. Come on. Let's go, Eileen. Good strategy for coming down these uh, spiral stairwells with Eileen. You get close enough to her to where she kind of runs a little bit quicker. And then instead of running directly down the stairs, kind of run at an angle against the wall. So it lets you move quickly, but not to the point where Eileen keeps falling behind. We've got to really start moving because uh, Walter, I think, is just going to start showing up here, which is a shame because we really want to clear out Forest World as best we possibly can because there's a lot of things that she can read here. And depending on how possessed she is, she's going to read different things. So like right now, this weird writing. Come on, Eileen, can you read this? Can you read the weird writing for me? The thing is, a lot of times she's not willing to do it if there's enemies in the area. And because these hummers are over here, even though they're not, like, active, I think she's refusing to read. She got hit a few times, too. That's unfortunate. Okay. Now will you read this? I can read this writing. Go. It looks like some kind of a diary. Here goes. October 2nd. I played with Bob. It was fun, but I went too far away, and he got angry. Okay. So we're going to get these little sort of diary entries, all of these bits of red writing that are from Walter himself. And the more possessed Eileen is, the more that she reads it as Walter. So like right now she's not really possessed at all. So we're getting this uh, reading where it's like she's reading it, but she's still reading it as Eileen reading the words. If she's at maximum possession, she's basically reading this in little Walter's voice almost. She's she sounds like a you know like a kid as she reads it, and uh, there's like typos in the subtitles where things are misspelled and stuff like that. It's it's interesting how. Her level of possession changes what you read with all of this lore throughout Forest World. Here goes. October 3rd. I played with Bob again. I went even further this time. Ugh, the writing fades out after that. So stuff like this where she says the writing fades out after that. If she's more possessed, that writing doesn't fade out. And she reads more of what's happening with the lore here. So what we might wind up doing is we'll see if she gets any more possessed while I go through Forest World. And then before we leave Forest World, might try to come back and reread some of these things and see if she reads them any differently. Exactly. She's more possessed, so she understands it more. She's more in tune with Walter because Walter is, in a way, sort of possessing her. So it lets her read more of it. 
You got the torch. Equipable item. The tip can be lit on fire to light up dark areas. Soak the torch in oil to make it last even longer. So this we can take back to uh, room 302 and actually soak it in that oil. There's a gas can uh, in the utility room next to the washer and dryer. You can go and soak the torch in that and it'll last longer while you're here. And then you can hit things with a lit torch. And there's Walter. Time to go. So for this, we're going to need to investigate all of these wells. And we need to find five, um, five different body parts. A doll's head, uh, left and right arm, and left and right leg. We got the head. A wooden doll's head, charred and blackened. Nutrition drink. Run. See, this is where it kind of sucks, because we're, like, running around, we're avoiding Walter, we're avoiding enemies, and we're waiting on Eileen to get close enough to us... Because if she's not close enough to us, she won't follow us to the next part of the, uh, the map. Is there any significance to the room number outside the game lore? Not as far as I'm aware, no. Like, I don't think room 302 was chosen for... Or I don't know if it was chosen for a specific thing. October 15th. Bob is gone. Nobody will tell me what happened. I bet... Ugh, I can't read any more than that. So we're seeing all of these diary entries, thoughts, essentially, of little Walters with a friend of his at the orphanage named Bob. Uh, Bob was another kid who winds up going to the metal prison, the uh, water prison. Because uh, they were misbehaving. They were, like, leaving. He talks about going as far as he could. Um... And it's like, yeah, he's he's leaving where he should be going beyond where he's allowed to go from the orphanage, basically. Here goes. October 18th. I have to stay in the round cell even if I read well tomorrow. If I do it, God will be happy. So I will do it. He comes into the round cell a lot to visit, but it's okay, I guess. So someone visits Walter in his cell a lot. Can you bop Eileen herself until she gets possessed? So you attacking Eileen does increase her possession levels, but we've recently had modders kind of figuring out more about how her possession works and it's it is not straightforward at all so it's like theoretically you could sit here and attack Eileen and make her more possessed but it might not reflect until you move a certain amount of distance um, or like progress beyond a certain point because a lot of times she'll like for example in Subway World you can leave her by herself, you can hit her, you can let her get attacked by dogs and ghosts and things like that. And while you're in Subway World, she looks fine. And it's not until you go through the area where Walter shows up, go through the spiral staircase, and get here to Forest World. And then as soon as you start Forest World, suddenly you see all of the possession like take effect. So then she's like really fucked up, she's got the bleeding effect on her... Uh, back and skin and everything so technically sitting here and hitting her would make her more possessed but it might not show up right away 
where it would change how she reads these diary entries. There's a note on the ground. Something's here, but nothing's here. I feel something from the well. Something's missing. Ah, it has begun. Jasper, I like that. <laughs> Filthy Bear, you point out, I, I also write my diary entries on the side of buildings. So, okay, this is a, a world literally created by Walter's mind. It's not literally a diary entry on the side of a building. It's a thought in Walter's head being put onto the walls of this imaginary thing, this this place that he has made from his mind, his memories. Um, so it's not like literal diary entries on a wall. It's just how it's represented. This, if this is supposed to be like a, a, a note written by Jasper, did he write in the scream? Or is this also just Jasper's thoughts being... <laughs> expressed in note form is this 4k I've never seen ps2 emulation look so good it's not quite 4k but it is uh, much higher internal resolution running through the ps2 emulator um, it's got a widescreen hack on it so uh, The POV is still correct. Two K. Well, I can't stream at anything higher than ten eighty on Twitch anyway. So, regardless of what it is, you guys are going to see it as ten eighty at best. Okay, so now we've got a holy candle. We need to get rid of this haunting. Get out of here, little Walter. Thank you. Let's just go ahead and drink that and top off health. And we're probably going to have another haunting out here now. Yeah. TV's haunted. Um, anything that I want to try to put away here? We have to pick up a lot of stuff, but I also have to clear out a lot of enemies. So I think I'll keep the gun and the ammo. Um, we'll put the paper cutter knife away. I'm still just going to hang on to the shabby doll for now. Let's soak the torch in oil so it'll burn longer. And we've got notes. There's a red paper stuck in here. My theory is that Walter never died at the prison. It may have been someone else who committed suicide. Either that or the person the police arrested was not the real Walter Sullivan. So this is Jasper, or Jasper, this is Joseph, Joseph Schreiber, the journalist who lived in 302 before Henry, trying to figure out, like, what is going on with Walter and these murders. Um, because Walter killed 10 people and then killed himself, but then other people started dying in similar ways where it looked like Walter was doing it. So he's trying to figure out a, a logical reason, a logical way for this to be happening. He's like, maybe they arrested somebody who was not the real Walter. So the person who committed suicide wasn't him. Like he's trying to, to, think of alternatives because the reality of Walter killing himself and then becoming a ghost with superpowers essentially in order to uh, allow him to try and finish doing this cult ritual wouldn't make a whole lot of sense but over the course of his investigation and everything with this Joseph eventually comes to that conclusion he figures out what's happening and then becomes a victim himself I'm in no position to investigate what's really happened at the prison, but in any case, Walter didn't die at the prison. The man with the coat that showed up here was the real Walter. Seven years ago, he did something in that apartment. I'm certain there's a link between that and the bizarre things that have been happening here. 
Just a little bit more and I'll have this whole thing figured out. I may even find that the real Walter is somewhere nearby. July 18th. So Joseph is like, okay, may even find that the real Walter is somewhere nearby. And in that sense, I mean, Walter's corpse, his physical body is in room 302. Walter's own ghost, Walter's spirit brought his own body here to room 302 and put it in the storage room that is now walled up. You soak the end of the torch in oil. If you light the torch now, it should burn for a long time. There we go. So now our torch will work better. It will burn longer. Which is actually not necessary if you're uh, very efficient with where you light the torch and where the wells are. Um, you, uh, you don't actually need to soak it in oil. But it does help. Alright, so we read the one over there on the left. We read this one. I want to make sure I don't skip any of the writing, if possible. Uh, we can also go ahead and place the doll head here to free up some inventory. A charred doll's body is sitting in the wheelchair. There's a message carved into it. Though my body be destroyed, I will not let you pass here to prepare for the receiver of wisdom. I cut my body into five pieces and hid them in the darkness. So remember, Henry is the receiver of wisdom. Joseph is known as the giver of wisdom. He's the one who's sort of giving Henry information about Walter and what to do to stop this. Uh, and Henry is known as the receiver of wisdom, the person who takes this knowledge and uses it to stop Walter. I mean, <laughs> for, for all the shit that we give Henry about being, I don't know, kind of weird and possibly stupid and out of it. He does essentially do the thing stops the ritual or does he i guess we'll see which ending we get when my body is once again whole the path to below will be opened if you are the receiver of wisdom you will understand my words the ritual has begun just like uh what we saw from jasper it has begun and we have the charred doll that's all burned up the same way jasper was all burned up a lot of parallels here Oop. Doll's head has been attached. Uh, this has writing, doesn't it? It does. Come here, Eileen. Where, where are you going? Okay, there's weird writing here. Here goes. Thank you. March 17th. I went to Ashfield again. It was my fourth time. Just like last time, my mother... Something... The city is scary and the apartment where my mother is has... Um, I can't read any more than that. Okay, so we only get like a little bit because she's not very possessed. Like pretty much no possession at all at this point. So, all we know is, you know, Walter was trying to get to the building where his mother was. Again, Walter believes room 302 itself is his mother. And he's giving little bits of information, but because she's not possessed, she's not able to, to read more than that. So there's no enemies in here, so that if you're going to leave Eileen behind anywhere while you, like, clear out areas, that middle room is definitely the place to do it. And uh, I do want to try and clear out 
enemies from these areas so that I can get Eileen to read any stuff in here. Let's make sure it's worth it. Is there any writing in this area? I don't think there is actually, but it's also just just a couple of bugs here. Yeah, we're going to have Walter in here. With a fucking chainsaw. Okay, there's also no writing in that area. But then there's writing here. Uh, where we dug up the key before. An arm coming up from the ground. Silver bullet. Special bullets effective against ghosts. Small diameter. Best used with pistol. Only used with pistol. Can't really use it with anything else. Um, very good. Very rare bullet. Uh, I think there's three of these in the entire game. Two or three. There's not very many. But essentially, it's a one-shot down for a ghost. So if you've got a sword of obedience and a silver bullet and a pistol, you can get rid of a ghost. You can pin a ghost down. And we're definitely going to need at least one for Andrew when we get to the water prison. Uh, so let's go grab Eileen. Bring her here. Let her read this. God, there's writing in this next area, too. But we're going to have a ghost in here, if I remember correctly. Does the bullet do much damage to Walter? You know, I think it does down Walter as well, but you can't sort of obedience him. Okay, so we've got a bunch of writing here, and no, there isn't a ghost here yet. So let's go grab Eileen, bring her through here, and have her read some stuff. You know, I should really try... I don't think I've ever tried saving a silver bullet to shoot Walter at the very end, like when you fight him as the final boss. I don't think I've ever tried that to see if that, uh, if that works. Okay. Read the thing, Eileen. Here goes. October 13th. I finally got outside. John is still stuck in that round cell. I hope I read well tomorrow. Could this be Silent Hill Woods? Eileen is figuring out things. She's so smart. And Walter, these are diary entries, his memories, thoughts about things that happened while he was in the water prison. Uh, stuck inside that round cell and different orphans that he knew first was a friend named Bob now it's John you can do it Eileen I believe in you am I in the way here goes. <laughs> October 14th. I did a good job reading today. I was so happy. But the 21 sacraments for the descent of the Holy Mother was hard. 
so they're forcing Walter to read and learn the 21 sacraments and he's having a hard time with it here goes October 16th some important people came today one of them duh it's cut off I can't read anymore there's our reference to the important people who came and talked to Walter about reading and about doing the 21 sacraments Da is Dahlia Gillespie from Silent Hill 1. Here goes. October 17th. The important lady told me my mother was asleep in Ashfield. I have a mother too. I'm so happy. I want to see my mother. Where is Ashfield anyway? So that is our evidence of Dahlia Gillespie being the one to put this idea in Walter's head. He believes his mother is room 302 of the apartment. Dahlia says, yeah, your mother's there. She's just sleeping. She's just sleeping there in Ashfield. But if you do this this ritual, you perform, you, you read good and you perform the 21 sacraments you can wake up your mother and be reunited with her it's one of the things that makes Walter a really sad sort of antagonist like yes he is a horrible murderer and given the context of everything you sort of uh, understand He's, he was just born and abandoned by his parents, happened to go to an orphanage run by a cult, and it ruined his fucking life. Like, he never had a chance to, to have a normal life. Let's see if we've got any new hauntings now. The TV was haunted when we last left. Um, and I did not pick up another candle yet. So that's just going to have to stay haunted. Put that away. Put our silver bullet away. Those are rare, and we absolutely want to make sure we keep one for Andrew. Though this isn't your most favorite Silent Hill, the story uh, really shines through the cons of this game. I agree, Bowie. It definitely has some, you know, it's it's got some some pretty serious flaws with I think a lot of the the gameplay itself and the some of the pacing. Um, but the story and the characters are all really really good, really really solid. Where, like, I still have a lot of love and appreciation for this game for those aspects. The things that it does well. Speaking of doing things well... There's a leg in this well. And I need it. Alright, let's go, Eileen. God. Don't shoot. Run, Eileen. Oh, she did not make it through. I'm going to have to go back. 
that's not good. So just doing that, even for a moment, Eileen. She's just a little bit chainsawed. She's fine. Hey, blah, blah. I'm glad you're enjoying it. That's one of the things I try to do the most uh, whenever I do these story playthroughs. It's just... I love these games. I've been playing them and, and learning about them for a very long time. Pretty much since they all came out. And, um, yeah. I always try to share stuff so that even if you're a big fan of these games, hopefully you'll maybe learn or consider something new. Got the chain. Light and easy to use. One snap could cause a lot of damage. There you go. We've upgraded to the chain. We are full Streets of Rage Eileen mode. And it's just going to make that jangly chain noise the entire time she's got it. <laughs> okay, again, I kind of want to leave her here and clear out the area, see if there's anything for her to read. Because we're about to get... our ghost for the area. There's actually a few different ghosts, but we're about to be the same way we went to the subway and uh, Cynthia showed up since that was where she died. We're here in uh, Forest World where Jasper became a victim. So Jasper's going to be back. There's the well. I need to remember to grab the limb out of that. Uh, nothing to read here. But then... It's time for Jasper, everybody. And Jasper's going to make reading in a lot of places difficult. It's going to be real difficult to get Eileen to read in a lot of spots because Jasper can just show up and if there's an enemy, Eileen won't read. And I'd rather not waste a silver bullet or anything to try and pin Jasper. But we may have to. Come over here where Jasper was sitting when he told us about Nakihona the first time around and uh, grab a Saint Medallion. Saint Medallion can be used to uh, prevent taking damage whenever ghosts are near you. But um, it can also be used to clear out room hauntings. And it can be equipped while fighting a ghost to... Uh, pin them a little bit easier if you're not using a silver bullet. But see, Jasper will follow us into like this area where there is something for Eileen to read. So if we don't have Jasper pinned, he'll just show up here and then Eileen won't read. Among the trash is a scrap of paper with something written on it. It's been a while since I came here to Silent Hill. Maybe I'll meet the devil this time. Always get real thirsty. Yeah, Jasper's note is still there in the car. We read that the first time around. You know, what I might do is just... Uh, we'll make a separate game save 
We'll use this silver bullet. We'll pin Jasper. Oof. We've also got another ghost victim to worry about here. I think there's three total. Plus Walter. Yeah, because then we have uh, this guy, Steve Garland. I think it's Jimmy Stone and Steve Garland. And then Jasper. Feel like Richard's the hardest ghost to pin. Richard can be pretty difficult. There's some strategies uh, that work pretty well to kind of counter his, um, his teleporting. But yeah, Richard can be kind of a pain in the ass. Yeah, brain tree that prick. A lot of stuff to read here, so we definitely want to clear out these uh, gum heads. Health is still good. We've got to come out here with the lit torch to grab that limb. And now we're full up on inventory, got the holy candles, but we're going to bring Eileen through here. We'll bring the torch, we'll get the limb, we'll have her read stuff. And I'll go grab the... I'll go grab the silver bullet. I'll make a save, grab the silver bullet, we'll pin Jasper, we'll read uh, the thing that's in that one room where Jasper shows up. And then we can reload the save to get our silver bullet back and save it for Andrew. Stun gun is awesome against gum heads. The stun gun is surprisingly good against a lot of things. Oh, man, we've got another room haunting. Yep, it's happening out here, plus the uh, TV. Let's go ahead and get rid of some of these hauntings. I'm going to get rid of the room ones, the ones that are actually in the bedroom first and foremost. There it is. Damn, still took damage. And then I could use the Saint Medallion to get rid of one. Um, in fact, I will. Just to show people, because a lot of people don't uh, realize that that's a thing you can do. Yeah, exercise the wall mold. So let's get rid of the... Oh, good. That got rid of the wall mold out here, too. Let's get rid of the TV haunting. If you equip the Saint Medallion and then stand near a haunting. Also, we can see... Uh... Very briefly there. You can see like an upside down character moving back and forth in like a weird way. I think it's Andrew. It's Andrew DeSalvo. It might be Henry. It might be Walter. I forget who the, the figure is that shows up there. But with a full Saint Medallion, stand near a haunting, you can actually get rid of it. Hey, Amos. Glad you've been enjoying them. And welcome to the live stream. Um, okay, so let's make a save before we use a silver bullet.
And put our health drinks away. Put Eileen's other weapon away. Bring a sword of obedience. Bring our silver bullet so that we can pin Jasper. Did you get to show the St. Medallion how it has the picture of Baby Heather and Mother Alessa? I mean, this is the most that you can show it in game. Like, you have to rip the asset and look at it in, like, a model viewer or, or something. You can look it up online if, if people want to see the image much clearer. But, yeah, like, you don't, you don't get to see it up close in the, in the game itself. Hey Dante. Yeah, it's definitely a big difference when uh, watching a speed run versus watching a story playthrough. There's nothing to read in this room, so that's actually not a bad place to pin Jasper. There's Garland. Don't want to accidentally shoot Garland, though. God, all three of them show up here. Let's just pin him right in here. Okay. Now we can uh, go grab Eileen, come back through this area, have her read some lore, and uh, grab these doll limbs that we still need. <laughs> that fucking chain sound. I love the fact that Eileen's just running around ready to beat the shit out of some monsters with a with a chain. for you to read. Here goes. October 1st. He told me I could write whatever I wanted because nobody will ever see it. I like to write. My teacher taught me how. I'm pretty sure that somewhere in these woods is an orphanage called Wish House. Yeah. 
we uh, we were standing right next to it, or I guess the burned down remains of it. Going crazy over there. Again, representing uh, the umbilical cord between uh, Walter's mother and himself. Which we talked about in part one of the story playthrough. Here we go. Things to read, Eileen. October 5th. I got hit again. I didn't do anything wrong. I wish he was dead. It's Walter talking about Andrew DeSalvo, I believe. Here goes. October 4th. My cheek hurts. I hate him. While he was, uh, being kept in the water prison... Andrew was abusive towards him and the other children. Here goes. October 6th. Tomorrow is book study in the chapel. If I can't read well, I'll wind up like John. I'm really scared. Book study in the chapel, where they're forcing the kids to learn to read and be forced, be forced to believe in uh, cults rituals essentially brainwash them into completing those rituals. Which is what happened to Walter. But there we go. She read the things. Now, I'm actually going to reload that save so we can save our silver bullet. Because we're going to need it. Got Eileen to read what we needed her to read. Now we can just run through, grab the limbs that we need, and head to the other stuff that she needs to read. Because that covers pretty much everything except for what's on the way to the lake. And there are some things for her to read right next to... Uh, Right next to Lake Toluca. And then once you pick up that limb, it spawns all of those uh, gum heads in there. So if you're ever playing through this and you want to uh, have Eileen read that lore, it's a lot easier to not pick up the doll limbs and have her read stuff beforehand. It was Dahlia, the one who brainwashed Walter? Yeah, Dante. We we just talked about that just a moment ago. That was one of the things that Eileen uh, reads, one of, one of Walter's diaries here in this area. There we 
Here we go. So we got this, the limbs that we needed out of here. those into the doll. <gasps> Free up that inventory space. Sorry, Eileen. But you need to stay here. Because there's twin victims and a bunch of stuff I gotta clear in this part to get her through here safely. Every time I look at it, it creeps me out even more. Take the pickaxe. The pickaxe of despair. Ordinary pickaxe from a construction site. Despair is written on the handle. Very powerful. One of the strongest melee weapons in the game here. It's kind of slow. Kind of, kind of really slow. But if you do hit with it, it does a lot of damage. And you can get a nice big spin to win attack when you fully charge it. The Spinaroonie. Are you Walter Sullivan? That's what everybody calls me, but I don't really have a name or a home either. Well, what about a mom or dad? Yeah, but I never met them. They left South Ashfield Heights right after I was born. But soon I'll get to see my mom. Do you know where she is now? Yeah, of course. Right where I was born. Lots of people tried to stop me, but it's fine now. It says in the scriptures that I'll be with her. I gotta hurry. Mom's waiting. This music is underrated? It really is. Also, you know, I just realized. I'm gonna reload that save again. Because most of the time that I'm, like, speedrunning and going through this game, I leave Eileen behind for this part. But if you trigger that cutscene and Eileen is with you, she's there in the cutscene, isn't she? It's a little bit different cutscene. Can't honestly remember, so let's just do it. We will just do it. Alright, same deal as before. Let's just go grab the limbs out of the well. We'll get Eileen. We'll just bring her right past the twin victims. And into that, uh, that cutscene trigger.
may have missed it, but how does little Walter fit into everything as far as being part of Walter's world? Little Walter represents the last little bit of innocence or goodness inside of Walter. Because Walter was not doing all of this just to be an evil guy. He's brainwashed. The cult is taking advantage of, you know, his trauma and brainwashing him to perform a ritual that he doesn't even actually know what it does. So that little Walter, young child Walter, represents that innocence, that good part of Walter. Kind of how Cheryl is the good part of Alessa. Not really. Uh, there is no bad part of Alessa, unless you're talking about like Silent Hill Origins, where they can for the movie, where they completely change Alessa around to be bad or evil in any way. Alessa is not bad. Alessa is not bad. She is not trying to do anything bad or harmful to anyone. She's not trying to get revenge on anybody. In Silent Hill One, Alessa is strictly, you know, a little girl who was raised by the cult, who was being used for a ritual, uh, who was accidentally burned as part of her, her psychic ability, sort of uh, taking on a physical form, causes a boiler explosion, house burns down, Alessa gets burned. Um, and then she's suffering a nightmare. And that nightmare is spilling out into reality. Alessa's not taking revenge, she's not evil, she's not bad, and Cheryl is not, like, a good part of her. Cheryl is just half of her soul. So, I wouldn't say that's a fair comparison with Walter. Never played Origins? Thank you for that. Well, none of that is explained in Origins. Origins explains it as there is an evil half of Alessa. Like, Alessa is trying to get revenge on the cult for what they did to her. Which is also what the movie does with Sharon and Alessa. So, those are the things that disregard Silent Hill 1. Everything I explained is how Alessa is depicted in the original game. It's also why a lot of people make that common mistake, you know, that uh, Alessa was bad or that Cheryl is like a good part of her. Like there's, she's not bad to begin with. Cheryl is just part of her. It is the other half of her soul. got Eileen with us and we should be able to read some of these signs and she should also be in this little cutscene with Walter does she not read it until after the cutscene hmm. Are you Walter Sullivan? That's what everybody calls me, but I don't really have a name. Oh, look. No, oh, she's not there. Eileen just fucks off for this cutscene well, no matter what you do. Dad? Okay, well, that's what I wanted yeah, to check. But I never met him. They left South Asheville Heights right after I was born. But soon I'll get to see my mom. Do you know where she is now? Yeah, of course. Right where I was born. 
Lots of people tried to stop me, but it's fine now. It says in the scriptures that I'll be with her. I gotta hurry. Mom's waiting. Pew, 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 pew. And yeah, just like UFO Techie said, some great music. Very underrated song in the soundtrack there. I wonder if you hit enemies a few times, but then stop for a few seconds, do they recover health? It kind of seems that way when you play Silent Hill 4. Enemies recovering health if you stop attacking them has been a thing since Silent Hill 1 or Silent Hill 2. Um, where, like, if you down an enemy and don't finish it off, it will eventually recover enough health to get back up and keep attacking, where you have to down it again. Um... Now, it only applies to that. Like, if they don't get fully downed, usually their their health stays the same until you get back to attacking them again. But definitely, if you hit something enough to down it and then don't finish it off, it will recover health. Some kind of suspicious-looking medallion. Take the medallion. Yes. Give. Give it to me. All right, time to read some things, Eileen. Here goes. February 10th. I went to visit Ashfield again. Again, I... Something, something... Mommy. Some of it's blurred and I can't read past there. So, we only get a little bit of this. Just Walter talking about going to Ashfield. Something about Mommy. But we, we don't get the full level of detail... But if you have Eileen, like, fully possessed by this point, when she's reading all of this uh, dialogue, she reads a lot more of it. Here goes. October 28th. I have to take a train or something to get to Ashfield. Everyone says Ashfield is a scary place, but I really want to see my mommy. Here goes. October 21st. Sunday is the day I leave the round cell to read the book. I read very well today. If I can do a good job reading the 21 sacraments for the descent of the Holy Mother, I can meet my mother. The important lady told me that, but tomorrow I'm going to the round cell again. So there is that whole plot element laid out. The important lady, that's Dahlia Gillespie, is the one who told Walter, if you, if you read well, if you believe in the cult and you do this ritual, the 21 sacraments for the descent of the Holy Mother, it'll let you reunite with your mother. You can meet your mother. Because she knew that that's all Walter cares about. That's all he thinks about. So she uses that to influence him and to brainwash him into essentially just serving the cult's needs and uh, performing the 21 sacraments. I think that's everything. All the readables. And I need to go put stuff away in the room yet again. Because there's so much shit to pick up in Forest World. Also, still no um, inventory box haunting. So I think keeping the doll on you confirmed... If you keep it in your inventory, you can pick it up and never put it in your inventory box and you won't get the uh, the doll haunting above your uh, inventory box. Confirmed. Put the revolver bullets up. Put the pickaxe up for now. And we're good. No doll haunting. Well, now that we've confirmed that that is most likely how it works, 
Let's do some testing. Let's put it in the box. Until we get the haunting. And then we will clear the haunting and take the doll back out. And we'll see if it recurs. If it happens again. So, like, if putting it in the box once basically triggers the haunting as one that can continually happen, or if it has to actively be in your inventory box to happen. We'll find out. Hey, what's up, Legate? Good evening. Where are we in the game so far? We are just about to finish up uh, Forest World second time. So we're going, we're about to finish up Forest World with Eileen. Look at this fog, baby. All right, let's go. <laughs> Look at this fucking ghost party. Once you uh, trigger that cutscene and come through here. Eileen, don't fight them. We have to go. Did she follow? She did not follow. She stayed behind to whoop ass. Eileen, please. Unequip it. <laughs> Eileen. <laughs> Give me your chain. I'm taking away your chain privileges. Come on. So if you've ever wondered in speed runs and stuff, why not just give Eileen a weapon? That's why. <laughs> That's why. Because a lot of times uh, you need her to, to hurry up and move through an area. And she will stop and fucking attack ghosts. And slowly accumulate possession for doing so. Because just standing near ghosts arms you and causes Eileen to get more and more possessed. There's the last limb for the doll. It's a de-pope. Some sort of priest wearing a cross. Or a member of the cult. There's a staircase going down. Can you save Eileen? Absolutely. That is... There are only two real factors. I studied archaeology back in college, but I... What does that have to do with anything, Eileen? Are you an archaeologist? Do you know what's going on because of ancient artifacts? <laughs> anyway. Um, there's two main criteria when it comes to getting an ending in this game. Whether or not you save Eileen and whether or not you clear your room of hauntings. Um, so those are, those are the things that affect what ending you get. So if you save Eileen, and if you clear all the hauntings in your room, you get the best ending. If you save Eileen, but you don't clear all the hauntings in your room, you get the next best ending. If you don't save Eileen, but you clear all the hauntings in your room, you get the bad ending if you don't save Eileen and you don't clear all the hauntings in your room you get the worst ending aka the best ending for Walter <laughs> what do you think about the upcoming Slitterhead I mean, I don't want to assume too much because there's not a whole lot about the game itself that's known yet, but 
I'm excited just for the people who are working on it. You've got a reunion of uh, Keiichiro Toyama and Akira Yamaoka for the first time since Silent Hill 1. They're working on a game together, so that's cool. Um, it's a lot of the people who worked on Siren uh, who came you know, onto the project and over to uh, Toyama's uh, studio that he made. Um, so it's, it's a lot of good people working on it that, uh, whose work I respect. It's like the monster designer from Siren and a few different people who worked on, on Project Siren. Um, Toyama himself, who directed Silent Hill 1 and the Siren games and, uh, did Gravity Rush and some stuff like that. Of course, you got Akira Yamaoka doing music. So it's got a lot of good people working on it. I hope it's good. I hope it's good. Um, uh, but I'm not, I don't, I don't get too ahead of myself on, on stuff like that. We'll see how the game itself actually winds up being, but it looks interesting. Yeah. There's a book here. It looks like some kind of Bible. Any Enigma subs, any Bibles in chat? The Descent of the Holy Mother, the 21 Sacraments. The first sign, and God said, at the time of fullness, cleanse the world with my rage. Gather forth the white oil, the black cup, and the blood of the ten sinners. Prepare for the ritual of the Holy Assumption. So we're going to see all of these ritual items, everything that's necessary for this ritual. We're going to find it in room 302, next to Walter's corpse in the storage room. Um, and some of this stuff should be familiar to fans of Silent Hill. If you played Silent Hill 2 and did the rebirth ending, you have to collect a bunch of ritual items in order to essentially try to uh, perform a rebirth ritual to bring back Mary. That's essentially what the rebirth ending of Silent Hill 2 is. It's a New Game Plus ending. Um, and the things that you collect for that include white chrism, a white oily substance, and a uh, an obsidian goblet, a black cup. So the white oil and black cup mentioned in this ritual are basically the same, two of the same ritual items that we've seen used in Silent Hill 2 for what was also supposed to be a rebirth ritual. The second sign, God said, offer the blood of the ten sinners and the white oil. So the ten sinners, the blood of the ten sinners are Walter's first ten victims that he removed the hearts of. Be then released from the bonds of the flesh and gain the power of heaven. So that is Walter killing himself, releasing himself from the bonds of the flesh, gaining the power of heaven when he becomes his own eleventh victim. From the darkness and void, bring forth gloom. Gird thyself with despair for the giver of wisdom. Darkness, void, gloom, and despair all represent other victims of Walter's. Giver of wisdom represents Joseph Schrieber, another of Walter's victims. The third sign, and God said, return to the source through sin's temptation. Source is Jasper. Temptation is uh, Cynthia. So again, we're still listing off Walter's victims. Under the watchful eyes of the demon, watchful eye is Andrew DeSalvo, wander alone in the formless chaos. Chaos is Richard Braintree. Only then will the four atonements be in alignment. So that's all of Walter's victims up to this point. The last sign. And God said, separate from the flesh too, she who is the mother reborn, that's Eileen, and he who is the receiver of wisdom, that's Henry. And that's why if you stand around near the twin victims, they have an animation where they'll point at Henry and they'll whisper that to him. They'll whisper, receiver of wisdom. Like, it's super creepy, but you can hear the twin victims say this to Henry when you're near them. Uh, if this be done by the mystery of the 21 sacraments, the mother shall be reborn and the nation of sin shall be redeemed. So we now have the full scope of the 21 sacraments and what Walter is trying to accomplish 
and who all of his victims up to this point have represented and that Eileen and Henry are our last two victims. Nice big fat halo of the sun altar here. There's an outline from some kind of heavy bottle here. An outline from some kind of heavy bottle. So there was a heavy bottle here that no longer is there. Interesting. Outline from some kind of narrow bottle. So there was a narrow bottle on one side and a heavy bottle on the other. Possibly the uh, cup and white chrism. Small vial, small thin narrow bottle of white chrism. And then the uh, larger obsidian goblet. And they're both missing because Walter came and took them uh, in order to perform the ritual. So they are where that ritual was performed. They're still in room 302. Why would the cult influence Walter to do this? I thought their end goal was to birth God. How does this benefit them? Because the 21 sacraments is a ritual to birth a God. Like it is to bring a God about into reality. The whole reunite with your mother thing is just what Dahlia said to Walter to get him to do it. He doesn't realize what he's doing is exactly what the cult wants. That the 21 sacraments is a ritual to bring about the cult's God. Well, one of them. It's also different sects within the order. So that's where things get a little bit complicated. There was some supplementary material for Silent Hill 4 that started all that, where there are different sects within the order. You would have a sect of the order that believes in Alessa, Saint Alessa, being the, the mother of God. So you've got a group of people within the order who believe in just that. But then there was also a group uh, of people within the order who believe in the descent of the Holy Mother, the 21 sacraments. So you've got people who are more believing in that. Um, and there was some supplementary material that they put up on the website when Silent Hill 4 came out that talks a little bit more about the different sects. Uh, it also goes into more detail with Walter's victims, since they are not all listed in the game. Um but yeah, it, it starts to really overcomplicate things at that point because you would look at somebody like Dahlia Gillespie. Dahlia Gillespie is using her own daughter, Alessa, to perform the ritual in Silent Hill 1. So if Dahlia is such a fervent believer of that method of birthing the cult's god, that Alessa is meant to be the, the mother of god, why would she be involved with any of this stuff going on with Walter and the 21 sacraments, you would think that would be handled by a completely different sect of people that Dahlia wouldn't mess with at all because she doesn't believe in that method. She doesn't believe in that ritual. She's more focused on using Alessa. You know, she was in the process of doing that ritual for seven years. So was that's where like some people theorize that Walter was meant to to be just sort of like a backup plan in case they never got the other half of Alessa's soul but then why would Dahlia still be involved see what i mean like it gets a little overly complex and complicated with that extra supplementary material about the sects within the order i just i just kind of simplify it in my mind as being they're all the same overall belief structure and religion, but they have multiple different uh, rituals that are meant to achieve different things. Even if it's just similar things like birthing a god, bringing a god of the cults into reality. Multiple different rituals, multiple different gods, different ways to essentially wind up at the same end result. And this just happened to be one of them that Walter was doing and is more or less successful. Kind of depends on it. Who?
Who's my favorite protagonist? Uh, Heather. Heather in Silent Hill 3, for sure. Just because you get to know her so much better than any other protagonist in the series, you know who she is as Heather. Um, the game is very descriptive when you get her inner monologue and when she examines things in the environment, you learn a lot about her. Um, plus everything that you know about her previous lives as Alessa or as Cheryl um, and how that impacts her life as Heather. Uh, plus, she's just like a really well fleshed out character to her own, you know, on her own within Silent Hill 3. She's just got a lot of personality right down to the very end. She's fucking making quips and not really, uh, you know, taking shit from um, <gasps> Claudia. She's just got a lot of her her character is is very well expressed throughout Silent Hill 3. Does it specify whether or not the gods they're trying to bring in Silent Hill 1, 3, and 4 are the same? No, it never specifically says whether they are particular gods or if they're different gods. A lot of people have made um, sort of assumptions and theories based on how they look that like the god that we see in Silent Hill 1 that is actually referred to as the Incubus um, is Samael. There's no confirmation of that anywhere, but a lot of people assume like within the cult gods that we know about, they refer to that one as Samael. But we don't know like specifically who or what this god is that's supposed to be the one that Walter is bringing back with this ritual. We don't know who or what the one is in Silent Hill 3 uh, that we see, you know, bringing back, being brought back. So it's all, it's all speculation. They definitely look different. But then again, you could attribute a lot of that stuff to the way Silent Hill works. It, it takes what's inside your mind, what you believe in, and can make that real so if you have somebody like heather or claudia whose idea of a cult god is this you know saint alessa you wind up with the god at the end of silent hill 3 who's kind of looks like a giant alessa head but it's unfinished it wasn't born properly so it's also got the big fucked up skeletal body um so it's like, does it look like that because it is a specific god that looks like that? Or does it look like that because that is what Claudia and Heather and Vincent and many of the cult members would believe that the god would look like? And the town is just using its power to take that belief and make it real. Make it look like what they think it would look like. And then in Silent Hill 1, you know, it looks different because it's going off of what is in Alessa's mind. In Silent Hill 4, it looks different because it's going off of what's in Walter's mind. It could just be the same god taking on different physical appearances because of whose beliefs are being used to make it real. Or they could just be different deities altogether. We don't know. We just don't know. But it's an interesting thing to, to kind of think about, for sure. Um, let's take some more bullets with us. We can clear out Water Prison next. Video games shouldn't make me think this hard, man. <laughs> That's one of the things I love about the Silent Hill series, though. Like, there's not a whole lot of video games out there that have made me think about them as much as Silent Hill does. 
Uh, it's part of why I fell in love with the series. It's one of the game series that showed me that video games can be so much more than just like surface level, have, a, have some fun gameplay, tell a story, and then wrap up that story at the end and be satisfied. Whereas like Silent Hill is very nebulous with all these things where it's like, here's something mysterious. It's never fully explained. Have fun thinking about it for the next 25 years. Like, <laughs> you know, um, it's, it's really, it's really cool. The fact that these games, you know, this game, Silent Hill 4, just, just in the case of this game itself, this game came out in 2004, you know? an 18 plus year old game at this point. And there's still a lot of things that I only learned about this game with, you know, the last couple of years, um, piecing together little bits of the story, finding bits of dialogue that I hadn't read or seen before, um, comparing ideas with other fans and stuff. The fact that nearly 20 years later, I'm still interested in going through this and learning about it and sharing what I know and other people are still interested in discussing it and sharing what they know. That says a lot about the quality of writing when it comes to a story that you people are still going to be discussing it and interested in it like almost 20 years or 20 plus years with some of the other games. Um, and that there is, you know, still such think about how many fans out there are still clamoring for like a new good Silent Hill game because there just wasn't a whole lot else like these games when they came out. And even still, there's been very few games that kind of have gotten to that point where people still talk about them and discuss them, you know, and, and want to learn more about them. Um, and on that note, we're about to go into water prison world. I think I'm going to take a break here, get up, stretch my legs. Been going for about two hours now. And um, go refresh my drink. All that good stuff. And then we will continue on with some more Silent Hill 4. The water prison, second time around with Eileen. We're going to have to get Eileen through the water prison without ladders. So we've got a lot to do here. But yeah, I will be back in just a moment.
All right. Get back to it. We have finished up. Yet another one of Walter's worlds. Just take a look around the apartment. We haven't done that in a little bit. Don't, use to, don't need to use that now. Stained with blood, smells horrible. Just like the water-filled room under that cylindrical prison, which is where we're about to be heading back to. Take a look outside. The Robbie hot air balloon is gone. This is so sad. Now that we've gone through Forest World a second time, does, uh, let's see, does he comment on any of this stuff differently? Nope. He won't target it to say anything about it at all anymore. What will I be playing after Silent Hill 4? I mean, that's going to be it for the stream once I finish Silent Hill 4. Uh, as far as, like, what will be the next Silent Hill story playthrough, I do not know. I might... I still need to redo my Silent Hill 2 story playthrough from the other day. Because my internet went out last week, right near the end of that one. So I'm going to be redoing 2. I still need to do everything else in the series. 1 and 3 at some point. Um, cause Jerry, if you're new here and for anybody else who might be new to the channel watching, um, I've been doing story playthroughs and in-depth playthroughs of all the games in the Silent Hill series since 2015. So I've been doing this for, for over seven years at this point. And I've gone through every game multiple times. Uh, and I try to go through and periodically just do story playthroughs again cause people enjoy them. And I enjoy doing them. But, um, yeah, eventually I'll go through the whole series. Because uh, it's been about a year since the last time I did these in-depth story playthroughs for all the games. But I've also got other stuff that I like to play and stream, so... Short answer, I don't know. I don't know what the next story playthrough will be or which game it will be. All right. Hey, Nub, what do you think would have happened to the town in Silent Hill 1 if the god was born? That's a great question. I have no idea. There's like a million different things you could try to extrapolate as far as what would happen. If it's anything like the god in Silent Hill 3, um, the whole world would essentially come to an end. The whole idea was to kill everyone and, you know, have the world, everyone reborn into paradise. Whatever the cult's idea of paradise is. No idea. No idea if it would have been same or similar or something entirely different with Silent Hill 1's God. Just more of this creepy imagery as we descend further and further down into Walter's mind, essentially. Why we have that note from Joseph telling you to go down to the deepest part of him. We're constantly going down this spiral staircase from world to world. Further into Walter's mind. Dude. 
There's not actually anything in here except the elevator, right? Yeah. Hey, Kenny. God, I love this. Just the visual of this. This impossibly tall elevator bringing us to the next one of Walter's worlds. It's tube shaped. Again, supposed to sort of represent that idea of... Uh, Of uh, that connection between, you know, mother and child, the umbilical cord sort of imagery. Excuse me, Walter. And of course, Walter is still pursuing you all throughout this. Oh, I should have brought a melee weapon. Because we're going to need to fight... Um, Some bugs. Get it, Eileen. God, Walter is so annoying. Okay. Bye, Walter. So many gunshots. Oh yeah, Walter is going full guns akimbo now. Like, he's got two fucking handguns. And he will rapid fire both of them. So kind of like before, there's some general strategies that you can uh, you can kind of try for each area, spots where it's uh, better than others to leave Eileen, while you kind of go clear things out and make it possible for her to uh, get through the area. For Eileen, it's going to be this room. It's so damp and gross here. I know. It's so damp and gross here. Okay, I have bullets to spare. How's her possession level so far? Uh, she's a little bit possessed, but she's doing very good for this stage of the game. You can see she's got a little bit of the deeper bruising on her skin and on her back. It's not quite as um, clean looking as it was like when we were in Forest World and having her read stuff where she had pretty much no possession level. So right now she's got like a tiny little bit, but not much, not much at all. Um, so we want to leave Eileen here. A good way to get that done is to push her into the corner and try to bump against her and then get to the door quickly. 
Oh man, the slugs came back. There we go, just like that. So that'll leave her there while we go sort of open up the water prison area. To get her through it. Does her possession slow down when Henry is near her? Um, that is sort of a weird way to phrase it, but her possession increases when she is left alone. We'll put it that way. If she's left alone, she gets more possessed. If she's left alone in areas with enemies, it increases even faster. Yes, possession is increasing, but we're just going to try to grab some of these things that we need. We came down here to where we found Andrew DeSalvo's body, and uh, Andrew's shirt is here with something written in wax. Maybe uh, if it's soaked in some kind of colored liquid, we can read what is written on the shirt. So we need to actually go back to room 302. And soak Andrew's shirt in blood in the bathroom. So that we can see what is written on it. See? And now we're back with her. But... You have to leave Eileen no matter what. And usually you're going to leave her in this room anyway, because this is your way back to room 302. We're going to leave her here. Go back to the room. Get uh, Andrew DeSalvo's shirt soaked in some blood so we can read what's on it. Yeah, her possession will continue to go up while we're doing stuff here. But she won't be alone for too long. It shouldn't... Shouldn't affect it too much. Um, Which haunting is this? Oh, hi. We have a ghost. I'm not going for any specific ending. I'm just kind of winging it, and we'll see what Eileen's possession level winds up at the end. I think no matter what, I'm going to clear the, the room hauntings. But other than that, no real plan. All right, so we're going to need our stuff for the Andrew to Salvo fight, which basically just means a silver bullet and a sort of obedience. Um, anything else? Pistol. Silver bullet, sort of obedience. We need to soak the shirt. Let's bring along the rusty axe, because uh, it'll be useful. It'll be useful. Oh, and we've got a red note. I'm going to summarize everything that I've learned about Walter Sullivan so far. He was born right here in room 302 of South Ashfield Heights. His parents abandoned him soon afterwards and disappeared somewhere, leaving the baby alone. He was discovered and sent to St. Jerome's Hospital. So it, he was correct so far on Joseph's part. Walter was born in 302. He was... A, Basically immediately abandoned. Frank Sunderland found him. Um, kept his umbilical cord. But then was picked up by an ambulance and taken to St. Jerome's Hospital. Where uh, they made sure that 
he was healthy, and then put him in the Wish House Orphanage. He was adopted by Wish House, an orphanage run in the forest near Silent Hill. It's run by this, the secret Silent Hill religious cult. So this is all stuff that Joseph had published articles about. So this is like public knowledge at this point. Uh, when he was six years old, someone from the cult showed him where he was born. That would have been Dahlia Gillespie. Since then, he started to believe that room 302 itself, in other words, this room, was his mother. Every week, he traveled from the orphanage to South Ashfield Heights, a pretty long trip for a kid his age. Sometimes he took the subway, and sometimes the bus. I'm tired. My headache is already killing me. I'll write more tomorrow. July 28th. I mean, the ghosts themselves of the other victims are essentially tools of Walter. Like, they are being used by Walter. Even if it's not Walter killing them directly, he still gets what he needs from the ritual. Even if Joseph was killed by Jimmy Stone rather than Walter directly. Yep, he took the subway, which is why the subway world exists. God, he's gonna pop out right here in my fucking face. Well, let's soak the shirt. My room is on the second floor, and I had to drink something with black things in it. So, this was the, um... One of the, the children's, the the cult's prison for the children. This was one of those children's uh, prisoner shirts where they're writing about what Andrew did. My room's on the second floor. I had to drink something with black things in it. So these are the bugs and slugs and things. The reason why there's tremors in the game, those enemies represent the black things, the slugs and insects that... Andrew DeSalvo and probably some of the other guards and people put into the water along with, you know, anything else that they were giving all of the children in the prison. Um, I hid the sword with the triangle handle under my bed. So gives you an idea on the second floor of the water prison world underneath a bed. There is a sword of obedience. So if you don't have one by this point, they give you one because you absolutely need one to take care of Andrew DeSalvo here. Um, that guy, the fat one, Andrew, took the basement key. Next time I'll stick this triangle sword into that pig and take the key, which is exactly what we have to do. We have to down Andrew DeSalvo's ghost, pin him with the triangle sword, and take the basement key from him. Um, and we've got everything we should need to do that. I'm just fucking everywhere.
So you can actually make out what Andrew DeSalvo is saying there. He's reading off the 21 sacraments. He's saying, gather the white oil, the black cup, the blood of the 10 sinners. Um, prepare for the ritual. Just 10? The first 10. The ritual is sort of split into two halves. Got the water prison generator room key. Key held by the ghost of Andrew. It opens the door on basement two. All right, so now Andrew can stay right there. Uh, but yeah, Blood of the Ten Sinners, we explained in part one of the story playthrough uh, back on Tuesday. But for the 21 Sacraments, I mean, we should be able to just... Uh, pull it up in the scrapbook. Second sign. God said, offer the blood of the ten sinners and the white oil. So, for the 21 sacraments, Walter has to kill the first ten victims and then be released from the bonds of the flesh and gain the power of heaven. So, the first ten victims, Walter killed them, took their hearts, removed their blood, used it for the first part. So, that's the blood of the ten sinners. The eleventh victim is Walter himself. He kills himself, releases himself from the bonds of the flesh. He sheds his physical form by suicide and gains the power of heaven. He becomes a ghost, a spirit with the powers to continue making these worlds and bringing people into them in order to finish the 21 sacraments. So then victims 12 through 21 are the remaining victims for the ritual. But that's where the, the blood of the 10 sinners comes from. Go it's not that there's only 10 victims, it's that there's 10 to start with, then Walter himself. And then uh, another 10. I don't know, Sale. Uh, other than the 21 people who died, does anything truly awful happen if Walter succeeds? Doesn't he just chill in the room for eternity? Or is this summoning God? The ritual itself is meant to summon one of the cult's gods. What that god is, who it is, what it will do, that is, like, not explained, not expressly said anywhere. So Walter succeeding, we don't know. We don't know exactly. Something written on the plate. Ah, we did this the first time around. That was the note for um, solving the water prison. Also, we see the greedy worm again here. The creature that represents the umbilical cord connecting Walter and all of his worlds.
Okay, this part. This part, this part, this part. A couple different ways we could go about this part. Let's uh, save the game and change out inventory a bit here. So we're going to go through this hallway. I showed it earlier where, uh, well, on Tuesday in the first half of the playthrough, where um, there's a bunch of twin victims. Uh, it's a big hallway the first time around with no enemies, and it's got really weird perspective. Where the door at the end of the hallway is gigantic. But now it's going to be proportioned correctly and full of twin victim enemies. Like a lot of twin victim enemies. I'm going to shoot as many as I can. And then I'll have my pickaxe of despair to try and clear out any others. Eileen's got her chain, so she'll be helping me fight. But this part can, uh, can sometimes go poorly. It's very easy to get overwhelmed and get the shit beaten out of you by twin victims. Bloody sink. We got the bloody sink haunting. Hope one bullet can connect to multiple twin enemies. As long as they're lined up correctly, it does hit multiple enemies when you try and shoot. But they don't always line up in a useful way. Does this game have multiple endings? Yes, this game has four endings. You basically have a best ending, a good ending, a bad ending, and a worst ending. Oh, that was perfect. Oh, it just had to get a fucking hit off too. But otherwise that was that Silent Hill call? Pretty much they kept all those kids locked up. Yeah, Eileen giving us some ideas of what's going on here. This is the water prison. It's where they kept those kids. <laughs> Kill, die written on the wall back here. Kill, die. Kill, die, kill. See bodies hanging in cages back in the background. Could be representative of just Walter's victims. Who knew Walter was such an edge lord? Mannequin hung this upside must be down. What hell is like. This must be what hell is like. I don't know, Eileen. Kind of 
out of the way. It's still just like writhing around. Being hung there. It's got things like needles stuck in its stomach. And of course this blood trail getting worse and worse the further down you go. These like random chunks of limbs or meat. Uh, don't think I need to go back to the room for anything just yet. Really small cages here. And considering we're about to be going to the building world and um, we're going to get some lore about uh, some of Walter's other victims, one of whom ran a pet store and Walter also killed all of the animals in the pet store. So it might be the reason as to why those cages are there. Oh, and we also get the introduction of Richard Braintree's ghost. It's a diary. I want to go back to that time. Things were so good then. The day of my birthday. The cute cat in the pet store. All those balls in the basket. Playing pool was fun too. The door of time was wide open. So the puzzle sort of for getting through building world. You have to put a bunch of things where they're supposed to go. Um, but it all sort of correlates to this person in their diary about this day, this birthday. Um, so day of the birthday. So you've got to get birthday candles and put them on their cake. Um, you have to get a stuffed cat and put it in a cage in the pet store. Uh, you have to find a volleyball and put it in with the other balls in the basket. You've got to find a pool ball and put it on a billiards table in order to open the door of time. When I see four things, I can't help but remember that time. And there's Richard kicking the shit out of me already. Definitely one of the cooler looking uh, ghosts. He teleports around, he's got these crazy, like, jerky jittery animations considering he was killed by electrocution it looks a lot like downtown ashfield it is it is downtown ashfield Eileen with the info Go ahead and take some pistol bullets. Got a bunch of things to kill here. There's a lot of uh, gum heads and other enemies. Holy candle, so we can go clear another haunting in the room. Um, and there is a way to skip most of this building world the second time around. So as it is, it can. This one can be pretty difficult. There's not a whole lot of really safe places where you can leave Eileen. And uh, you've got a lot of clear, a lot of enemies out. You've got a lot of ghosts chasing. It's a long way to get from place to place in Building World. Um, and just get the whole thing opened up for Eileen to come through. But you can actually skip a lot of it because of a glitch here. So this fence 
is separating out uh, another area that you get to later on. And with Eileen, if you leave her here, which you can do by getting in this back corner and sort of bumping her and then running this way and getting into the elevator, you'll leave Eileen here. And when Henry goes to this area on the other side of the fence, Eileen can run right through this fence and catch up to where you are and actually skip pretty much almost all of Building World the second time. And I'm always tempted to do it. I'm always tempted to do it, to do it every time I play this game just because Building World second time is one of the most annoying just places to get through and do the intended way. And you don't really miss out on any kind of lore or anything by skipping it. There's not a whole lot new here compared to the first time around. There is like, um, there's a newspaper where you find out about Walter shooting up the, the pet store and, um, you hear some sound effects of gunfire and animal noises outside of that. There's not much else that you get here, but we'll try and do it the normal way. Let's see what we can do. Of course, Eileen will not be able to follow whenever you uh, go up and down ladders. So you wind up leaving her in that elevator a lot. Game would have gone by much easier, much faster if Eileen told us earlier she could walk through walls. I know, right? Why didn't you tell me before? Maximus, thank you for these 69 bits. Nice. Have you played Soma? I did, years ago, uh, and it's archived here on Twitch. Type exclamation point VODs, V-O-D-S, in chat, and you'll get a link to my uh, collections page. Just look for the Soma playthrough. What's a cue ball doing here anyway? There's one of our... Items we need. We need birthday candles. We need a stuffed cat. We need a volleyball. And this billiard ball. The cue ball. Door is locked from the other side. So eventually we'll open this door up. Squarsh. Splort. Just want to try and clear out enemies where I can. Sullivan, it's time to complete the 21 sacraments. But that's my name. And what are the 21 sacraments? Don't worry. You'll know soon enough. Well, let's go and see Mother. Let me go, that hurts. Damn. Damn. 
And Cynthia's here. Oh, stop it. Stop it. No special favors. Oh, I'm stuck in her hair. Yeah, so little Walter. Representing that last bit of innocence, that last bit of good that's inside Walter. Walter is tired of his last bit of good interfering with trying to see his mother. Trying to finish the 21 sacraments. He's basically taken him out of the equation. Um, we need this. This is a weird place for a volleyball game. Uh, eventually we'll come pick up that Saints medallion. God, if only I could clear out these wheelchairs. Because we're going to have to bring Eileen through this room. And it is very possible to soft lock here, kind of. Where, um... She gets stuck in the wheelchairs. Okay, so we can't pick up that holy candle. We're going to need to... Go back to our room and drop some stuff off. Made me laugh out loud when you said you got stuck in Cynthia's hair for some reason. I mean, that's what's happening. She, like, her hair goes out and grabs you and you can't run away from her uh, when you get close to her if you touch her hair. She can kind of hold you in place. There we go. Billiard ball on the pool table. There's a memo here. The boss said we have to change our phone number because of all the complaints about the weird noises. Now we have to change the store sign on the roof. What a pain. By the way, the number is the last four digits of the new phone number. Not too smart if you ask me. So we've been here once already where 3750 was the last four digits of the phone number at the time. Now we've got a memo saying that there's a different number, a new phone number. So we have to go call the old phone number from our room to get the new one. So let's go clear out our inventory a bit, call the number, figure out the code for the door. Do all that. And uh, we'll also get rid of this guy. We need to get rid of some hauntings, and we've got some candles for it. Oh, we've got so many hauntings right now. We have the cat haunting, we have the sink haunting, and we have the ghost coming through the wall, Jimmy Stone. Get rid of Jimmy. That's right. Get out of here. Did you hear the cat? You hear the cat meowing? Is there anything else? I could get rid of another haunting, but I think we're fine. So we still have the uh, bloody sink haunting as well, but if we open up the fridge, we find out where the meowing is coming from. Remember the dead cat that we found in the apartment world the first time around? We had to get a scrap of red paper from it. 
Well, we have a wiggly dead hunk of something in our fridge now that was making cat noises. Some mysterious lump of flesh. It's a red scrap of paper. Continuing from yesterday, I'm going to summarize everything that I've learned about Walter Sullivan so far. So we started reading what Joseph was writing about Walter Sullivan, everything he'd learned up to a certain point, and then he sort of ends that note as like, I've got a headache, I'll write more tomorrow. Well, this is what he continues writing. Naturally, it was a long way for a kid his age to travel, but he made the trip every week by subway or bus. Unfortunately, someone else was living in this apartment, and so he couldn't be reunited with his mother, room 302. For years, he continued to come here, almost like he was possessed, just to peek into the apartment. Eventually, the tenants began to complain and treat him badly when they saw him hanging around. Walter began to fear the tenants and see them as obstacles preventing him from seeing his mother. So Richard Braintree was one of the worst there, which is why Braintree winds up becoming... Walter's uh, victim. As the years passed and Walter, mature, uh, Walter matured, he began to be more and more influenced by the teachings of the cult. Furthermore, his obsession with his mother and his feelings of resentment towards the outer world became even deeper. Walter became preoccupied with one particular tract from the cult's Bible, the descent of the Holy Mother, the 21 Sacraments. By the twenty-one sacraments, the Holy Mother shall appear in the countries of the world and shall bring salvation to the sinful ones. So that's the ritual that Walter had been raised to believe would reunite him with his mother, with Room 302. After Walter left Wish House, he moved to Pleasant River, a town neighboring Silent Hill. For a while, he lived the life of a normal student, but he was still filled with bitterness and resentment towards the rest of the world. Several years later, he launched his plan there, the 21 Murders. So this also makes another interesting mention. It says that after he, Walter left Wish House, uh, the orphanage in the edge of the woods in Silent Hill, um, he moved to Pleasant River, a town neighboring Silent Hill. We read about Pleasant River in Silent Hill too. The note about Walter Sullivan uh, has, like, they're interviewing somebody and it's or or it's ta giving information about Walter Sullivan. It says that his hometown was Pleasant River. So this sort of retcons that little bit of note about Walter in Silent Hill Two, where Silent Hill Two the note mentions it being Walter Sullivan's hometown. And in this game, we learn that he was born technically in South Ashfield, lived most of his childhood in Silent Hill and then moved to Pleasant River by the time he was a normal student. I would assume college-aged, roughly. But that's everything that Joseph knows regarding Walter, the 21 sacraments, and sort of what Walter has done up to that point. Still nothing out there. All right. Back to building world. And there's an extra note that shows up in here that I'm trying to make sure I don't miss. The note that can very easily be missed. Um, oh, I forgot to call. That was the other thing. We need to do the phone call and get the uh, the four digits, the new phone number, which is going to be the solution to this keypad puzzle. And it's always the same. It's always... It's not like randomized or anything, but I just like showing how to get this solution in-game. So you're supposed to call Bar Southfield, 
which is 555-3750. You get that number by looking out your, your window. The phone number you are trying to reach is no longer in service. The new number is 555-4890. Four eight nine zero. Let's call it. And then we get that noise just now. What was that? So that's what happens when you call 3750 the first time around. Fucking monster otherworld answers the phone. All right, let's head back. Hey, wicked. Glad you're enjoying the stream. So four eight nine oh. Collapsed walls in the way. I can't get through, so we can't go upstairs. But we can go downstairs. And there is a lot of Hummer enemies in here, and we are gonna have to bring Eileen here ultimately. So it's worth trying to get rid of uh, some of these, if not all of them. And little floaty flying bugs with a pickaxe. Not the easiest thing in the world. See if I can get them gathered up closer to the bottom. Double kill. Let's fucking go. And we get a health kit for our troubles. And a door where we can't just leave Eileen all alone. So behind that door, remember the whole goal of all of this, the note that we got from Joseph at the end of uh, the part one playthrough from Tuesday was a note from Joseph saying, go down to the deepest part of him and to find the one truth. Behind that door is the one truth. Which is our pretty much one and only boss fight outside of Walter himself at the end of the game. But we need to have Eileen with us to get through there, so... Right now, we're just kind of clearing the path that we're going to need to bring Eileen through. 
because she's still waiting for us back in the elevator. But I got the billiard ball in place. I need to go drop the volleyball off. We still need to pick up the stuffed cat and the birthday candles. Still a lot to do. Still a lot to do. Oh, shit. Also want to pick up this uh, holy candle. Right here. Didn't have room for it when I came down initially. Grab this Saint Medallion also. A lot of ghosts to deal with here. about everything we can do there so now we can go oops go back up all oh, right this is the other elevator we can go back and forth between one side of the elevators and the other this is the one that Eileen is in she's still not too bad off as far as possession goes Check middle button. This should be where we started, the very beginning, where Richard's ghost was. Yep. Nothing else we need to do there. We just want to go top button. Ah, shit. Alright. Let's just go ahead and put the uh, Saint Medallion on. We really need Eileen to follow us. Oh my god, the dog. Oh my god, Eileen walked into my attack. Going horribly wrong. It's alright. It's what Jesus invented the gun for. Give me that nutrition drink. Sorry, Eileen. Yeah a hell of a sound effect to just throw in there. A lot of these sound effects when you're just running around horrible moans and groaning at rate squealing like megaphone mic feedback. Here we go, we can put the volleyball in here. Boom. Hey, what's up, Zedek? Some beautiful artwork. Kate Candle's here. That's weird. Any more diary entries Eileen can read later on? Sadly, no. They only do that throughout Forest World. I would have loved more of that uh, throughout the rest of the game. There we go. Some cake candles. We're going to need that. Okay. Am I okay? Oh, Richard. Yeah, fuck him up. 
Okay, apparently we're not safe from Richard. Uh, Kolesny? Kolesne? Thank you so much for the prime sub. Cole, S-N-E? I'm not sure. Let me know what you prefer, how to say your name, because I'm terrible at reading things, apparently. <laughs> thank you so much for the support. Appreciate the Prime sub. Thank you, thank you. Welcome. What the hell? Something reeks. It might be that giant slab of presumably human skin. Maybe, just maybe. Okay, got another holy candle. And my inventory is going to be full again. So once again, back to the room. Go ahead and use this hole here. See if we got any other hauntings. We can go ahead and clear some of the other hauntings with the candles. Free up some inventory space. I know, kitty. Let's put candle there, and then Saint Medallion stand over here. We should get rid of both hauntings simultaneously. Yeah. So there we go. Saint Medallion has cleared out the uh, haunting in the fridge, and the holy candle cleared out the haunting in the sink. Still nothing out here. Oh. Something's going off. What is it? What the heck is haunted over here? It's not the clock. Is it the chair? It was the chair. Haunted chair. Sneaky. And it's gone. Go ahead and top off health. Make a save. Stash our heels, keep some pistol, keep the rest of this with us. All right, let's get out of here, Eileen, before fucking Richard comes back. Holy candle to get rid of those pesky red wine stains. Dude, I constantly clean my house with holy candles. They're the best. There's no way to kill ghosts. You can down them and pin them with a very rare item called the Sword of Obedience. 
and there is a limited number of those swords, but there is no way to kill them. This is a weird place for a stuffed animal. So there's the stuffed cat. Stuffed cat with droopy ears. It's Minmo. We need to take Minmo to uh, the pet store. There's birthday cake and champagne here. Let's put the birthday candles in the cake. Sound effects. Another health drink. All that's still broken. Another holy candle here. Some revolver bullets on the car. What's a car doing here? Golf club, the pitching wedge, and a driver. Let's go drop off inventory. We've got a lot of golf clubs. We have quite a golf club collection. Ah, uh, we got this one. This haunting again. Just go ahead and get rid of that. And that should work. Stash that, stash that, stash those. Shabby doll. We still have not gotten the doll haunting, even after putting the shabby doll in the inventory. Kind of interesting. Take a few more bullets. Two, three, four, five, six, seven golf clubs so far. We put the volleyball away, we put the billiard ball away, we put the cakes, uh, candles where they need to be. And we just need to take the cat. Take the cat to the pet store. I don't want to deal with that noise. Boop. 
Sounds like something out of uh, Bloodborne. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Sir, please. I beg you. Come on, Eileen. trying not to, Eileen, but you're being slow and in the way. Come on. As far as possession goes, Eileen's still looking not too bad. Eileen's hanging in there. Hey, Tyken Rom. Just wanted to say loved streams. Helped me get into the Silent Hill franchise. Thank you for these nights. Hey, thank you. I'm glad you enjoy all the Silent Hill content, all the VODs and streams. Appreciate you coming here, hanging out on the Twitch channel. Yeah, glad you enjoy it. Thank you. Cynthia. Pet food here. I want this nutrition drink. I want these bullets being greedy oh my god fucking ghosts everywhere put the cat in the cage okay stuffed cat has been placed into the cage I can hear the sound of a clock from somewhere oh god stop thank you Eileen Eileen's being an MVP Eileen we gotta go There's a newspaper on the ground. According to the Ashfield police, on at approximately 8.30 in the evening, witnesses near the pet store, Garland's, so there's been a ghost floating around with a, um, trying to stab us with like a shovel, a little spade. That is Garland, Steve Garland, who, uh, I don't know if it's a link to Lisa Garland, if he's related somehow. It never confirms that one way or the other. Uh, reported the sound of multiple gunshots, possibly from an automatic weapon. By the time the police arrived, the perpetrator had already fled and the shop owner, Steve Garland, was found dead with a probable submachine gun shot wound to the head. All of the store's animals were brutally slaughtered and the store left in extreme disarray. In addition, inside sources say that Garland's heart had been removed. So Walter killed him by shooting him in the head, but then needed to take his heart as part of the ritual, since Garland was one of the first ten victims. But then Walter also killed all the animals in the pet store. Just because. And on his back, five numbers were carved. So then we hear the gunshots and the animal sounds. And if we go back into the pet store, there's bullet shots in all the walls. There's blood everywhere. The shelves are all fucked up. There's uh, crime scene tape everywhere. The store is a mess. Eileen, help! Uh, 
Help, Eileen! I'm stuck in her hair! Smack her with your fucking chain! Thank you! Now that I'm almost fucking dead. And Eileen is now very possessed. <laughs> she took a lot of possession from that. Yes, Eileen still gets more possessed by being around ghosts. Stop shooting the one on the ground, Henry. Fuck. The one flying around pecking your brain, please. Target that one. Thank you. Yeah, Eileen's not doing so hot. Hey, I never promised a good ending. That's why I said we'll just kind of see how Eileen is by the end of the playthrough. We'll wing it. Because even when I'm really going out of my way to, to do my best and get uh, Eileen through the game with uh, low possession, sometimes this game is very unpredictable. Uh, I'm about to die. I'm about to die. I need to get that health drink. I need to get this health drink. I need it, I need it, I need it. I did not make it to the health drink. That fucking dog. Just had to zoom over to me. The dogs are so fast. One of the enemies in this game that'll just speed up infinitely to catch you. There is no outrunning them without some very careful dodging. Oh, and I'm all the way back here. Okay. It's true, Bowie. Even with Eileen in maximum possession, it is still possible to kill Walter quickly enough to get a, uh, a good ending. At the very least, it for sure is still possible on easy. I don't know about normal or hard mode. Normal and hard mode, Eileen at max possession, it might take too long because Walter has that extra amount of health for the difficulty, so... Easy mode, like speedrunners can can kill Walter quickly enough on easy difficulty. To get a good ending. Although although that being said, we can also manipulate the difficulty. Up, Eileen. Tyken Rob, thank you so much for that brand new sub. Very much appreciate the support. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate your support of me and the channel. Enjoy your emotes and enjoy the stream. Okay. Let's just try and get Eileen through here. We can hopefully get her a little little less possessed oh and if we don't read the uh, newspaper there about Walter 
the uh, pet store does not get shot up and uh, it doesn't change. So if you leave that newspaper alone, you don't get that audio of the, the gunshots and the animal noises and the pet store uh, doesn't get the police tape and stuff everywhere. Interesting little thing to note. Come on, Eileen. Power, power through the bugs. I believe in you. Follow me. Oh, she did. Sandwich. I'm scared. I'm scared. Oh, she's getting possessed. She starts talking like a little kid. Uh, you know, Walter is uh, possessing her more. So she's about to be more possessed. Once we uh, leave this area, it'll be more noticeable. There's our three iron. Some golf club collecting. There's our seven iron. Go ahead and just drink that. Okay, she's still not showing it visually, but she's definitely more possessed. And there's Richard. Yeah, she's definitely not in good shape if she's already uh, doing the baby talk thing. alone leave us alone so that ghost up there in the overalls that's Garland Steve Garland who we just read about Walter killing him Mom Eileen need you to get back here I already picked up this uh, Saint medallion. Alright, let's see if we can get Eileen through the chair gauntlet. This part can actually be pretty dangerous. Oh, fuck. It's easy to take a lot of damage and for Eileen to get hit and take a lot of possession. That was not bad, though. That was not bad. going Eileen we're almost where we need to be let's see if we can pull her oh no I got hit by that enemy come on 
Riley, let's go. Ignore them. Ow. Kill it. Considering the circumstances, I guess we're doing pretty good, huh? Okay. Don't actually hear that one, that bit of dialogue from Eileen very often. Considering the circumstances, I would say we are doing pretty good. But I need to go back to the room here, make a save. And, um... Get set up for the one truth. And of course we've got residual apartment haunting stuff going on. We might have some new hauntings here. Anything? Anything? Oh, this is a good one. This is a good one. See the blood dripping out of the peephole in the door? Yeah, it's like a fucked up ghost version of Henry. Probably what Henry looks like as a ghost. If, uh, if Walter kills him. Forest world and building world, the actual naming scheme in the game, or is it your own name for the levels? It's the actual names, naming scheme in the game. Like, right now, if I go save my game... Return from building world. Second time. That's so strange. It's not. I explain it in part one of the playthrough from Tuesday. Um... It exp the game flat out tells you Walter is creating his own worlds. Like, whenever you go through a hole from your apartment, from room 302, and you wind up somewhere else, you're not physically teleporting to that place. You are, your spirit or your soul or your subconscious, whatever, is going through the hole and going into a world that was made by Walter. His memories have created these places that are significant to him. The subway that he would take to get from the orphanage to room 302, all the times that he would come and visit here. The forest that was surrounding the orphanage where he grew up. The water prison where he was kept when he wasn't doing what the cult was asking of him. Um, the building world of downtown where he killed several victims and was also in between the subway and the apartment and then the apartment itself. All these worlds are being created by Walter. So you're not going to those actual places in, in the context of the game. You're going to Walter's worlds, the places that he has created based on his memories. So the game refers to it as what, what it is. It's building world. It's subway world. It's kind of a strange naming convention, but in the context of the game, it makes sense. All right, so let's take some bullets for the one truth. And uh, let's actually switch out for the hand axe. It's not quite as much damage as the pickaxe, but the hand axe is faster, uh, charges better, it's more reliable for a lot of things. And the one truth can be kind of a pain in the ass, so want to make sure we're stopped. Drink 
one of those to top off. Reload the gun. Go ahead and save again. Hey, William Cutter. Hope you're doing well tonight. Hey, Brain of Mensis. It's going well. Who's the one truth? Well, it's not so much who. The one truth is representative of essentially reality and what Walter has been lied to about. Like, the cult, and specifically Dahlia Gillespie of the cult, has been brainwashing him, lying to him about what his this ritual that he's trying to perform does. He thinks that it will reunite him with his mother, Ultimately, it does not do that. It's the cult's means to birth a god that they've just sort of tricked him into. But the one truth it's, is represented, it's supposed to be this one true fact of Walter's life, but it's represented as sort of a boss fight. We have these giant, well, you'll see in a few moments, at the bottom of the staircase. We'll see it in just a moment. This is another part of the game where even if you're being pretty careful, Eileen can take a lot of possession here. If she gets hit by the one truth, and she tends to get in the way of Henry's attacks when he's trying to target and attack the one truth as well, so... We'll do our best. We'll see how it goes. Essentially, what we're going to try to do here, we need to attack all of these giant wallmen to find out which one is the one truth, the one real one. Yeah, see, she's getting hit a lot here. This enemy is just... 12 fucking layers of bullshit. This is pretty bad luck. There it is. And once you find the one that you attack, where all the others uh, react. Oh, Eileen's down. She's going to be very possessed after this. That was really unlucky. Eileen took a lot of damage there. So she's going to wind up being uh, very possessed after this. Yeah, you can see the marks on her are more distinct now. She's going to start uh, having little moments where she freaks out more. Also, it was foggy in the background as we've been descending up to this point. But after confronting the one truth... We're moving down into the deepest part of Walter, the way the note from Joseph said. 
And the background is not like foggy anymore. It's just pitch black. Can you reduce possession? Only temporarily, and it will not affect... So this is this is one of those things that, that takes a bit to explain if people aren't familiar with how things in this game work. So Eileen's possession really only matters at the very end of the game. When you're fighting Walter in the final battle, the final boss fight, Eileen is basically walking down a staircase towards a giant meat grinder. And how quickly she walks down that staircase towards that giant meat grinder depends on how possessed she is. So that possession level directly corresponds to if she's going to go quickly towards that meat grinder or if she's going to go slowly. So while she's doing that, you cannot interact with her at all. You, you can't interact with her at all. You can't put down candles that will affect her. You can't get near her. All you can do is fight Walter. So the whole point of the boss fight is to fight Walter and defeat him faster than Eileen walks into that meat grinder. So if she's less possessed, she walks slower and you have more time to deal with Walter. If she's maximum possessed, it's still possible to beat Walter fast enough, but I mean, you've got to basically be on your top speedrunning game and get lucky with some of Walter's attacks and patterns. So you can reduce Eileen's possession while you're walking around through the game. Like right now, if I wanted to reduce her possession, I could put a holy candle down next to her and wait for it, and her possession would lighten up. But it doesn't matter how many holy candles you use, once you get to that final battle with Walter, she's going to revert back to whatever her maximum possession level was before the use of any holy candles. She won't stay healed up. So, long explanation just to sort of explain, yes, you can undo her possession level, you can reduce it, but it doesn't actually reduce for the thing where her possession level is the most important, which is the final battle, which determines the ending of the game you get. Does that make sense? You can reduce possession level, but it's not worth it. That's the short answer. Will this be uploaded to YouTube? Probably. Although that's entirely up to a uh, sci-fi guy. That's up to Dorian, who handles all the uh, YouTube stuff. Otherwise, this will be archived here on Twitch. I always archive these playthroughs here on Twitch, and it'll be added to the uh, overall playlist. So, there it is. There's that link in chat. Which has everything that's ever been on the YouTube channel, plus way, way, way more. There's a ton of videos that have only been archived here on Twitch. And that you can only really watch here. So yeah, her stopping and saying stuff like, uh, where's mommy? Just goes to show, you know, some of that indication of her possession level. And there's Dancing Baby! Sci-Fi uh, sci Guy vids got taken down recently. They're not taken down. They uh, Sci-Fi Guy started a separate channel. Type exclamation point YT uh, for the link to the new YouTube channel. And for anybody who found me through YouTube or enjoys watching the VODs on YouTube, that's where everything is going to be now, is that link to the uh, Restless Dreams channel. It's still Sci-Fi Guy running it, and Sci-Fi Guy still has my permission to upload archives. But, um, yeah, it's just a new channel. That way Sci-Fi Guy can keep his... Um, James Cameron channel separate from all the Silent Hill re-uploads. There's a diary on the ground. 
I had that weird dream today, the one with the man with the long hair and coat. He was crying and looking for his mother again. I saw that man with the coat ten years ago at this apartment. He was going up the stairs carrying a heavy tool, an old-looking bowl, and a bag that was dripping blood. I never saw him again after that, but a few days later, the neighbors complained that they heard strange noises coming from the supposedly empty room 302. So I took a look around room 302 and found signs that someone had been in there, but nothing odd other than that. But that's where, uh, but that's when it all started. I can, I still hear strange noises coming from the window of room 302. Sunderland. So that's a diary entry from Frank Sunderland. The superintendent of the uh, South Ashfield Heights apartments. Oh, look at that. Those are all just doll heads in a fucking cage on wheels there. Creepy. But a little bit more info about how long Frank has been seeing Walter in uh, the apartment. Seeing him with an old bowl, that uh, obsidian goblet. And now we are in room 302, but it's not our room 302. It's room 302 as it was for Joseph back before Henry moved in. So when you're walking around uh, in Henry's room, in room 302, in the very, very beginning of this game, you are seeing things from Joseph's perspective, not Henry's. And one of the things that gives that away is the dialogue when you're examining things in the room. You look at Henry's TV and the dialogue says, what's this big TV doing here? This is where my record player should be. So now we're in Joseph's time of living in room 302, where it is his record player here. Uh, he looks at this shelf where the radio is and says, I don't even know what this is. You can see the shelf is smaller. There's no radio there, just books. Sorry, Eileen. And yeah, Joseph's got holy candles stuck around everywhere because at this point he was already being uh, haunted by things happening in room 302. And he's already being affected by Walter uh, essentially coming for him. He's coming for him because he needs him. He's part of the 21 sacraments. There's an old picture book and a red book here. There once was a baby and a mother who were connected by a magical cord, but one day the cord was cut and the mother went to sleep. The baby was left all alone. But the baby made lots of friends at Wish House and everyone was very nice to him. The baby was happy. His friends told him how to wake up his mother, so the baby went right away to go and wake her up. But the mother wouldn't wake up. No matter how he tried, she wouldn't wake up. So this is literally just explaining Walter's life. The cult telling him that the ritual was a way to wake up his mother. But no matter how he tried, she wouldn't wake up. Because the one that he was trying to wake up was actually the devil. The baby had been deceived. Poor baby. So again, this is just literally explaining the plot of the game. Walter's trying to perform this ritual because he's been brainwashed by the cult and specifically Dahlia to think that this will reunite him. This will wake up his mother that he thinks is this apartment. Like he doesn't think that it's a person. He thinks this room, that this apartment, room 302, is literally his mother. Um, but the one he's trying to actually wake up is one of the cult's deities. You know, they just flat out refer to it as the devil, but... It's one of the cult's gods. The baby cried and cried and cried. When he thought of the mother, he remembered the feeling of being connected to her through the magical cord. Just then a ray of light came down from the sky. The light was very warm and made the baby feel good. 
and the baby looked into his hand, he saw that the magical cord was lying there. When the cord, uh, with the cord clutched in his hand, the baby went happily to sleep. So this is how we put Walter to sleep. This is how we get rid of his influence, his spirit, his soul, his whatever you want to call it, his ghost. He needs to be reunited with that cord that connected him to his mother, his umbilical cord. Lucky for us, Frank Sunderland, the actual uh, superintendent of this apartment complex, kept that umbilical cord. Very lucky for us that he's a weirdo who kept it. Crimson Tome. She who is called the Holy Mother, be not holy one wit. The descent of the Holy Mother is not but the descent of the devil. Those that be called the 21 sacraments, be not sacramental one wit. The 21 sacraments be not but the 21 heresies. To give birth to a realm of wickedness within the blessed realm of our Lord, be blasphemy, blasphemy and the work of the devil. If thou would stop the descent of the devil... You must bury part of the conjurer's mother's flesh within the conjurer's true body. This is what we're going to have to do in the final boss fight with Walter. Before you can do anything to Walter, you have to have the umbilical cord and you have to sink, like you have to put that umbilical cord into this large creature, this big monster looking thing. You would think that the big monster looking thing is the god that Walter is trying to summon, but look at what this says. You must bury part of the conjurer's mother's flesh within the conjurer's true body. The big monster that we're seeing is Walter. That is the actual Walter. The guy with the long hair and the coat is a projection of Walter. It's what Walter used to look like when he was alive. It's why Walter is using that image to go around and, and continue doing things. But Walter himself is that creature when we do the final boss fight. Thou must also pierce the conjurer's flesh with the eight spears of void, darkness, gloom, despair, temptation, source, watchfulness, and chaos. Each of those spears representing the last eight of Walter's victims. Do so, and the conjurer's unholy flesh will become that which once it was by the grace of our Lord. So you put the umbilical cord with Walter's true body and then pierce the conjurer's flesh, Walter's true body, with the eight spears. And then Walter's unholy flesh becomes that which once it was. It makes him mortal again. It makes him able to be killed again. So that whole note explains exactly what you need to do and why you're doing it for the final boss fight. The gate to hell? Why must I destroy this wall? So we get some clues to what's here. Because in our room 302, this is just a normal wall. It's not cracked or anything like that. So this gives us our clue to uh, breaking down this wall to see the rest of the apartment. There's a storage room here. And that's where Walter's physical body is. As well as where he performed uh, the first parts of the 21 sacraments ritual. So his ritual items are in that um, in that area, in that storage room, along with his body. And it is also, since it says the gateway to hell there, it's also going to be our passage into the deepest part of Walter, where we finally confront Walter himself. So we've got a lot of stuff to read here. It's a piece of red paper. What's with this room? So this is all the dialogue that we saw at the very beginning of the game. When I said that you're the, literally the very, very beginning of the game. You start the game up, you watch the intro cutscene, 
Then you go to a first person view of somebody waking up in room 302 and you can walk around and explore the room. Um, you're made to think that that's Henry, that you're seeing things from Henry's perspective because that's how it is for the rest of the game. But in that very first first person segment, you're not Henry, you're Joseph. You're seeing Joseph's last moments through his eyes. And this is the dialogue that you read whenever you examine things in the room during that first person sequence. What's with this room? It's covered in blood and rust. This is my room, but what the hell has happened to it? This room, is it really my room? It's in terrible shape. The air is so heavy, my head hurts. Creepy, it looks like a face. So that's all the first things that you see when you're exploring the room and when you look at the face uh, that's coming through the wall uh, that winds up being Jimmy Stone's ghost that kills Joseph Schreiber. And then he writes, what the hell am I writing? August 2nd, Joseph. So there's our, our connection being made to that very first sequence to let you know that that is not Henry, that we're seeing things through Henry's perspective. We're seeing things as Joseph. I can't break down the wall. August 3rd, Joseph. When the bell rings, Eileen equals mother's body blood. August 4th, Joseph. So we had a note earlier that references um, the, the mother reborn. And I explained that that's Eileen. This is the note where we see that Joseph also came to that conclusion. Piece of red paper. The Crimson Tome. Bury part of the conjurer's mother's flesh within the true body of the conjurer. Part of the flesh equals Super's room. So this is where Joseph also makes the connection that the umbilical cord that Frank Sunderland held on to is part of Walter's flesh, part of the conjurer's mother's flesh as well, since it's the cord, the umbilical cord that connected Walter to his mother. I also love that Joseph Schreiber uses like a bright pink typewriter. And it's also pretty much the only thing in the apartment that shows any color. Um, so Hirimi, your answer is not, not quite accurate. And I, I've, I've talked about this in the part one of the playthrough, but it comes up all the time. So Silent Hill four, when they, when, Members of Team Silent very, very, very first started working on the project. It was not a Silent Hill game. It was just called Room 302. That was its temporary work title as a project. Room 302 was supposed to be inspired by what the team had learned working on Silent Hill games, but it was meant to be like a distinct separate game. Very, very early in Room 302's development, it was decided to make it a full-fledged Silent Hill game. So it was changed very early on in its development to be a Silent Hill game. And then when they decided to tie it in as a Silent Hill game, they started looking at other bits of lore from other Silent Hill games to sort of expand upon to write the story for it. And they decided to go with Walter Sullivan, who's originally mentioned in Silent Hill 2. You've got a note about Walter and his killings. You have the game show host sequence in the elevator in Silent Hill 2 where they talk about Walter killing Billy and Miriam Locaine. And it's in Silent Hill 2, it's supposed to just be this background thing. Team Silent hadn't planned out four games worth of Silent Hill. They didn't even know that they were going to make another one after the first game, let alone stick around and make four games before Team Silent was disbanded. So it's not like they had four in mind when they were writing to and writing about Walter Sullivan. Instead, when they decided to make Room 302 Silent Hill 4, they used those notes from Silent Hill 2 to expand upon and come up with the plot for this game. But there you go. Technically, it did not start as a Silent Hill game, but it was very, very early in development 
where they decided to make it a Silent Hill game. And it was developed pretty much side by side with Silent Hill 3. You had your main members of Team Silent working on 3, and then a lot of B, B team Team Silent members working on Silent Hill 4, with a few people going back and forth and working on 3 and 4, uh, like Yamaoka. And time to get some information from Joseph Schreiber, well, his ghost, himself. All right. <laughs> Shit, sorry. What was I supposed to do again? Yeah, in case uh in case Joseph Schreiber didn't make it perfectly obvious there. Uh he pretty much explains everything. He explains what all is going on. 
he mentions, uh, you know, that Walter believed that this room, this apartment was his mother, that he wanted to purify it and that he was brainwashed into thinking the only way to do that was to perform the 21 sacraments. He performed the ritual of the Holy Assumption, which was the first half of the 21 sacraments. He killed 10 people and himself. And now he's dead, still trying to complete that ritual to reunite with room 302 that he believes is his mother. And Joseph wants us to find him, his true location, and kill. Kill him. Kill him. Because now he's nothing more than an inhuman killing machine. I like the way Joseph phrases that. It's like he was human at one point. Even when he was fucked up, there was still some semblance of humanity left. Not anymore. Now, inhuman killing machine. He also explains during the cutscene uh, that his younger self, Walter's younger self, manifested in the world. That we get the explanation that he's become divided between his sort of blinding, you know, desire to be reunited with his mother and then giving up that, that innocence and good of his child self in order to do so. There's a pickaxe stuck in the wall. Hope is written on the handle. Doesn't look like I can use it as a weapon. We have two pickaxes in this game, one of hope and one of despair. And the one of hope cannot be used as a weapon. The one that is the, the pickaxe of despair can be and is one of the strongest melee weapons in the game. But this one has a very specific use. Let's see what room hauntings we have now. Yep, still got that one. Oh, I heard it. We're going to see it in a moment. So if you pick up the shabby doll and put it in your inventory box, this haunting happens. This is also one of the hauntings that's missing from the PC version. They're cute. Are they? Are they cute, Pythonicus? So now that we've gotten the haunting, oh, once it triggers. I mentioned I was uh, I was like, hey, once this haunting happens, um, I'll try pulling the um, the doll out of the inventory box to see if I can stop it from happening once it's cleansed. The doll is not in the box anymore. Look at this. Like the doll is just gone once this haunting triggers. I never actually paid attention to that before. So let's uh, clear it. Let's get rid of him. 
Put our Saint Medallion on and stare at him. Let's go ahead and save it. Did you count how many of them there were? No, I didn't, actually. I didn't even think to count how many of the dolls are there when that's going on. Is it 21? Is it a full 21 sacraments? Oh, right. We still have uh, this one out here. We still got Creepy Henry out there. I don't have enough left in the uh, Saint Medallion to get rid of it, though. We don't have another candle yet. Scrap of red paper stuck here. The closet one is random skulls. Uh, number one, ten heart. Number two, ten. Number three, ten hearts. Number four, ten hearts. Steve Garl. Number five, ten. ten. Number six, ten heart. Number seven, ten hearts. Billy Locaine. Number eight, ten hearts. Miriam Locaine. So this is our list of all of Walter's 21 victims for the 21 sacraments. Um, hey, Uncle Grumpus, thank you for the host. So give me a moment. I'm going to go ahead and talk briefly. By briefly, I mean we're going to spend some some quality time here. <laughs> um, talking about Walter's victims. So they only give you so much information in-game about each of Walter's victims. We know about Steve Garland from the pet store, the newspaper, talking about him being shot and uh, stuff like that. But who was number one and two and three? Like, who were all these other victims that very easily could have been listed and given information right here? Some extra red notes slipped under the door or as part of this note. It's information that could have very easily been put in the game. But instead of putting it in the game, for whatever reason, they made some extra uh, supplemental lore and put it on the Konami website when Silent Hill 4 was out. So let me pull up the victim files, which were some of the... So here we go. Victim files. And uh, I'm reading these through, uh, they're all archived on silenthillmemories.net. Uh, so if you ever want to look all this stuff up for any of that archived information that used to be on the Konami website, it's a good source for info for all of the Silent Hill games. Um, but the victim files. This section contains the Walter Sullivan victim files for the 21 sacraments originally found on Silent Hill 4's website. Some of the content's been edited and changed to make more sense, because these things were sort of mistranslated originally. Uh, these victim files contain major spoilers about the plot of Silent Hill 4, blah, blah, blah. We know. We know. The victim number one out of 21 is Jimmy Stone. He was a priest uh, in the order of the sect of Valtiel. Remember, there's some supplementary lore here that explains that there were multiple different sects within the order that had different beliefs and wanted to follow different rituals. Um, he was nicknamed the Red Devil, which is another one of those retcons from the Silent Hill 2 notes about, not necessarily a retcon, but they gave it a different meaning. Because in Silent Hill 2, the note about Walter Sullivan, uh, they make mention of the Red Devil. He's trying to kill me, he's trying to punish me, the Red Devil. Um... In the context of Silent Hill 2, the Red Devil is supposed to be sort of your precursor that 
Pyramid Head exists as a thing. Um, for Silent Hill 4, they sort of retcon that to being Jimmy Stone. They give him the nickname of Red Devil. Uh, so the information it gives there, it gives a lot of information with um, that info that was originally on the website. So we get uh, the victim name, Jimmy Stone. We get their occupation, priest of Altiel, order of Altiel in the order. Um, sex and features. Middle-aged white male, muscular, his height and weight. He's 190 centimeters tall, 85 kilograms. His hobbies include playing darts. Like, it literally gives hobbies and others. Like, you get all this information about all the victims. We might not have needed all of this info, but at least a list of their names and maybe a little bit about how Walter killed them would have been nice to have in the game. Uh, his theme of murder was the Ten Hearts. In method of murder, he was shot in the back of the head with a gun. Murder location was the first floor of the Wish House in Silent Hill. And he left behind a shred of scripture. Jimmy Stone created and became a priest of the Valtiel sect to mediate between the Holy Mother sect and St. Ladle's sect. So these are the two sects of the Order. And apparently he created a third sect that was supposed to help tie the other two sects of the order together or be a mediator between them. The Valtiel sect is closer to the god and their ethics are to worship Valtiel, which also means acting as executioners. Jimmy was killed with a gun and his body was found in Wish House, which was managed by the Holy Mother sect. Ironically, his right-hand man, George Roston's body, was found in Wish House as well. Victim number two, Bobby Randolph, uh, occupation high school student, sex and features. He's a husky black male, aged 18 at the time of death, uh, was 180 centimeters tall, 140 kilograms in weight. He, his hobbies included he liked ghosts, paranormal, horror, and scary stuff. And uh, hanging out with fellow hobbyists, Sane and Jasper. So Jasper... And Sane and Bobby Randolph were all the fans of the paranormal and the occult stuff. They were the fanboys who just were interested in the order, interested in Silent Hill and the cult and all of this stuff going on. After Joseph published his articles about the cult and it became public information, people like Jasper, people like Bobby Randolph, people like Sane, Martin, uh... You know, they became interested in it. They were fans of the occult, and they thought it was something interesting. Theme of murder, ten hearts. Uh, method of murder, killed by strangulation. Murder location, the Pleasant River University campus. Pleasant River University campus. So that's where Walter attended school, was in Pleasant River. Uh, item left behind, a book about occult and paranormal stuff. So we found the note earlier in-game that talks about Walter going to Pleasant River after he had grown up, you know, for school. Uh, Bobby was a student and horror fanatic who used to hang out with Sane and Jasper. On the day he was killed, he said he was going to look for a devil. In fact, a book, sh uh, a book of occult and paranormal subjects was found by his side. Sane Martin was killed at the same location as Bobby, and both of them were murdered by being strangled to death. So victim number three was St. Martin, who was Bobby and Jasper's friend uh, that was also with them. He's a high school student, thin white male, aged 18 at the time of death, 184 centimeters tall, 65 kilograms in weight, loves paranormal, scary horror stuff, hanging out with uh, Bobby and Jasper, 10 heart theme of murder, killed by strangulation, also on the campus, left behind a camera. Uh, Sane liked to hang out with Bobby and Jasper, who shared his interests in the paranormal, they seemed to be fascinated by Silent Hill and its eerie atmosphere. One day they overheard a conversation about being uh, someone being compared to the Holy Mother, but who, but who could also be a devil from a church in Silent Hill. They heard them say this person was now at Pleasant River University. Sane and his friends could not hold back their curiosity and decided to sneak into the university. So they found out about the occult and, uh, you know, they were fascinated by Silent Hill because they just liked the paranormal. And they found out about Walter, 
and then tried to go learn more about Walter by going to Walter's college. And that is where Walter killed them. Victim number four is Steve Garland. Uh, this was the manager of the pet shop, the guy floating around in the overalls, stabbing us with a, uh, a small spade, little shovel. Um, he was shot with a submachine gun uh, in his head, uh, specifically not in his chest so that Walter could collect his heart for part of the Ten Hearts ritual. Uh, there was something to Steve, a pet shop owner, uh, couldn't, or there was something Steve, a pet shop owner, couldn't forget. It was 26 years ago. A boy who came to his shop happened to drop an animal cage from a shelf and injured an important pet. Years later, in the same shop, Steve was murdered with a submachine gun, his body filled with dozens of bullets. His heart was taken away, and a five-digit number was carved into his back. Bloody things happened twice in the pet shop Garland. So there were multiple incidents that happened in Steve Garland's pet shop. But it mentions a boy coming into the shop and dropping an animal cage. That may have been Walter. It may have been why we also have to take that cat and put it in the cage that's up on the counter as part of the puzzle getting through Building World uh, and through that pet, short, uh, pet store. Uh, victim number five is Rick Albert. This was the manager of the sports store that was also in Building World. So it's another one of the ghosts that we see in Building World. A uh, middle-aged white male, liked baseball, volleyball, golf. We find the baseball bat weapon. We have the volleyball puzzle where we need to put it back in the box or in the cage with the other ones. Method of murder, he was hit by a golf club. So this could be another reason why we have the golf club weapons all throughout this game. The fact that you can collect like a full set of clubs. Uh, and he left behind a volleyball. A volleyball was missing. Rick Albert, a delicate but avid sportsman, was looking for a volleyball in his warehouse when a shop staff employee who was working part-time rushed into the warehouse and excitedly told Rick that the owner of the pet shop had just been killed. He explained that the owner was shot by a submachine gun, his heart was taken away, and there was a crest carved onto his back. Rick wondered how he knew so many details about the murder. So, Rick was around whenever um, Steve Garland had been murdered. And a shop staff employee who was working part-time rushed in to excitedly tell Rick about that. Walter may have been that employee, or maybe one of the people who closely follows what Walter was doing was that employee. It doesn't really say specifically. Victim number six was George Roston. Uh, who was another priest of the Valtiel sect, another member of the order. Middle-aged white male, uh, killed with an iron pipe in an underground altar in Wish House. Uh, George, the priest in charge of the Holy Mother sect, was the right-hand man of Jimmy Stone, Walter's first victim, who was also known as the Red Devil. He devoted himself to raising a certain individual to become a skilled follower. So they were the ones who were in charge of raising Walter to follow the cult scripture and perform the 21 sacraments ritual. He succeeded in having Valtiel snuck into this person's unconsciousness to permit the 21 sacraments to take place, but he could not control the person whom he raised, and the 21 sacraments began to be performed in a way he didn't expect. So even though they did what they could with Walter, Walter wound up not even reacting in the way the cult had meant him to. Victim number seven, Billy Locaine. This uh, Billy and Miriam, victims number seven and eight, um, were the twins that, uh, when Walter killed them, are represented as the twin victims throughout the game. Uh, killed with an axe in front of the Locaine house in Silent Hill. Painters were painting Billy Locaine's roof. The color was a vivid blue, a shade reminiscent of the Mediterranean Sea. While Billy was playing with his ball, the sky grew cloudy and threatened to rain as a damp wind blew in. Billy's father came out to call him back inside uh, the house and found that Billy was hiding in the bushes. He told Billy to come out, but Billy didn't move. As his father approached the bushes, he found Billy dead, slashed by an axe. And we hear about that in Silent Hill 2 as well during the uh, elevator game show part of Brookhaven. 
chopped into pieces with an axe. Uh, Miriam Locaine, victim number eight, uh, Billy's sister. While her father stood standing and staring at the dead body of his son, Billy, her panicked mother came out of the house and saw something even more horrible. Miriam's body was laying on the street. Miriam had been killed the same way as Billy, but Miriam's body had been even more brutalized because all her mother could find was part of Miriam's body. Victim number nine, William Gregory, owner of the watch and clock store. So that was another ghost in Building World. Elderly white male uh, was stabbed with a screwdriver. William Gregory was famous for his skills with clock and watch work. Despite his age, his skills were not at all rusty. Sixteen years ago, a middle-aged man dressed in all black left him a broken watch. At first sight, Will didn't realize, uh, William realized that it was not a normal watch, but he didn't know why. That night, William had a strange dream. A basket that has volleyballs, a kitty that, ha that keeps weakly meowing, a feast and a birthday cake on a table, an upside-down room, billiard balls moving without people playing. It was as if the dream was trying to imply something. So that's all the puzzle stuff that we have to solve getting through Building World. That apparently... Um, Walter's ninth victim, William Gregory, the owner of the watch and clock store, had a premonition or a dream about. Victim number 10 was Eric Walsh. So let's see, we're past these number of victims. Victim number 10, Eric Walsh. He was the bartender in Bar Southfield and was shot in the face. It was Eric the bartender's special day, and things only seemed to get better due to the information given to him by a middle-aged customer. Uh, he said the pet shop owner was brutally killed, and the pet shop was trashed. As a result, the bar owner uh, decided to close early because the criminal was reported to still be at large, and Eric got to go home early. When he arrived home, a feast and cake were prepared on the table to celebrate his special day. Eric looked for his family, but it wasn't his family who was in the house. So... Eric Walsh, the bartender, was the one who was having his birthday. The birthday candles and the cake that we find in Building World, um, that was all for him. That scene that we see with um, the guy pinned down, the first ghost, the first time we go through Building World, uh, who's already pinned by a sort of obedience, is uh, Eric. That's Eric Walsh himself. He's in that setup where the, the feast and the cake and all is there in the apartment. And uh, we learn that that is when Walter at some point got into his apartment and killed him. Victim number 11, holy assumption, is Walter Sullivan. So Walter himself is victim 11. He committed suicide using his soup spoon to sever his carotid artery while in prison. Uh, we read about that first in Silent Hill 2. That's the first thing we ever know about Walter Sullivan. And they do keep that aspect of him as part of the lore in this game. Everything is unknown. Even the dead body has not been found, so it may be inappropriate to call it a John Doe. However, it's true that there is a victim. He's considered to be able to perform the Assumption Ceremony using his scripture, White Chrism, Obsidian Goblet, and Ten Hearts. They said the one who can perform the Assumption Ceremony is the one who was raised by George Roston, but all the details are uncertain. So, a little more information there about Walter. Victim number 12, Void, is Peter Walls, a high school student uh, who was beaten to death. Uh, Peter was getting high in the alley across from South Ashfield Street. There's a rumor that he bought marijuana from Toby Archbolt, the priest, there was an old ladder belonging to the hotel next to the alley. He just climbed up the ladder in front of his friends, and all of a sudden he disappeared. Nobody saw him again until his body was found. So this was a high school student that was buying marijuana from one of the priests of the order, um, Toby Archbolt. And Toby Archbolt is actually going to be victim number 14. But... Uh, Peter Walls was victim 12, victim 13, Sharon Blake. Um, this is the old woman ghost that we've been seeing around. 
Uh, Sharon knew the Silent Hill Church was a fraud. She believed that the church had abducted and was keeping her family. She would often go to the church, but wouldn't be allowed to see them. One day, Sharon decided to go to the wish house that she had heard about in an article about child abuse that had just been published. That's Joseph's article. Worried about her family, she decided to go into the woods. And she was drowned in the woods outside of wish house. Uh, Victim number 14, Gloom, is uh, Toby Archbold, who was a priest of the Holy Mother sect. Another member of the order. He was pushed off a 100 meter high cliff. The Valtiel sex influence began to dwindle after its two priests had been killed. Seeing opportunity, Toby Archbold, a priest of the Holy Mother sect, began illegal dealings to increase his own sect's influence. One venture included starting a sightseeing business using the money he had made through his shady ventures. After reopening Wish House for Orphans, Toby was elected to city council for his contribution to the city and people. So he is the one who opened up Wish House as an orphanage. So it's very clear why Walter would have a grudge against Toby in particular. Victim number 15, Despair, also known as the Giver of Wisdom, Joseph Schreiber. So this is the the silhouetted man that we just spoke to in that cutscene not too long ago. Uh, the journalist who is living in room 302, the person who's been writing all this information that we've been reading through the red scraps of paper under Henry's door. Uh, so Joseph himself was victim number 15. Uh, also known as Jay, the journalist who was interviewing and researching a cult infamous for the negative rumors that surrounded it and had heard the screams from a mother whose son was kidnapped by the cult. He introduced a five-page scoop article about them in the gossip magazine Concord to get people's attention. Then we get to victims 16 through 21, which is where this game pretty much starts. The very, very first sequence of the game, we see from Joseph's perspective, his last moments. And then we pick up as Henry going into Walter's worlds and we see victims 16 uh, and onwards happening. So that is Temptation, Cynthia Velasquez, uh, 17, Jasper Gain, 18, Andrew DeSalvo, 19, Richard Braintree, 20, who's supposed to be Eileen Galvin, and 21, who's supposed to be Henry Townsend himself. So there's a lot more there that I didn't read. Um, but again, SilentHillMemories.net. It's a great website. You can go on there, read all of the supplementary material, that they had for Silent Hill 4 on the Konami website back in the day when this game released. It gives you all the victim files. It gives you some extra info about Walter and about Joseph. Um, just a lot of nice extra info that very easily could have just been put in the game. I don't know why. Why, why, why make the supplementary material limited and stuck up on a website when it could have just as easily just been some notes in the game, just like any, any other info. Ugh, okay, with all that explanation done, getting back to what we were doing, we just came from um, Joseph Schreiber's version of Room 302, along with this pickaxe of hope. So we can use this to break the wall and get into the storage room that's been sealed off this whole time.
there's Walter himself. There's his actual physical body. Because Walter is just such a chad. He killed himself as victim number 11 out of 21 and basically became a ghost with superpowers and moved his own body back to room 302 in order to perform the first half of his ritual. How did he manage this, though? He's literally just a ghost with superpowers. Here's the explanation. Offer the blood of the ten sinners in the white oil. So, white chrism, blood of ten sinners. He kills the first ten people. And here is the white oil. Ten sinners, first ten victims, white oil. Be then released from the bonds of the flesh and gain the power of heaven. Released from the bonds of flesh. He kills himself. He releases himself from his corporeal body and gains the power of heaven, which is basically the power of Silent Hill, the, the power to create his own realities from his, his mind and pull people into them to influence them. But by performing that first half of the ritual, that is what allows him to manage doing this. He kills himself and literally becomes a ghost with the powers of Silent Hill. What the? What the hell was Walter doing in here? Bone saw for cutting up victims. This must be the cult's Bible. It's a bowl made from obsidian. So we have, again, those familiar ritual items from Silent Hill 2. The white chrism and the obsidian goblet. A mortar and pestle. There's some kind of residue in it. So we can see that's where he uh, performed the first half of the ritual. What's this in the refrigerator? Bags of blood and things like that. So there is the blood of the ten sinners. Or the containers that was used to hold it. Blood of his first ten victims. And then he himself as the eleventh victim. Walter? His body. It's tangled up in some kind of pipe. Should I investigate? There's something in his coat. Inside the coat pocket, got the keys of liberation. Extremely evil looking keys held by the corpse of Walter. Evil looking keys. I mean, they look just kind of like normal keys to me. I'll take your word for it. And the dolls are back. Let's see, at this point we're not going to really have Eileen fighting things anymore. But I don't think I can get rid of this. Yeah, I can't. Gotta count them all now. Didn't we get the answer to that though? 15, right? 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Yeah, 15. 15 dolls confirmed. Use a candle and the doll appears in storage again. Well, I saw that the the doll was missing last time the, the haunting happened. We cleared it once already. I didn't even think to look in the inventory to see if uh, clearing it brings the doll back to be removed. Um, but I don't have any Saint Medallions or candles right now, so we'll have to try again later.
empathy. Eileen is still right here. She's fine. She's doing great. <laughs> All right. Time to use our evil keys. Keys of Liberation. I like how you don't see Henry just like opening the locks normally or anything. It's like you approach the door with the Keys of Liberation and you don't use them. The, the locks just explode off of the door. Eileen? There's Eileen. Unequip your chain. Oh, she started to say something. She's like, this is our apartment, but it doesn't look right. Why is it all fucked up and covered in ground hamburger? I just want to put this weapon back in the box because we don't really need Eileen to have a weapon at this point. Hey Myra, welcome to the channel. This is not my first time playing this game by a long shot. But welcome, I'm Nub Zombie. I mostly focus on Silent Hill games. I'm a huge fan of the series. I've been playing them ever since the first one came out back in 1999. I've been streaming Silent Hill on Twitch since 2015. I do speed runs, uh, challenge runs, and in-depth story playthroughs of every single game in the series, even stuff like the arcade game, the play novel, Book of Memories, everything. And I've been doing that for uh, over seven years now. So welcome. Welcome, welcome. You are in the middle, or very close to the end of, a Silent Hill 4 in-depth story playthrough, where we're explaining Silent Hill 4 in great detail. Hey, cats. Hope I'm still in time for some Silent Hill 4 story. We're getting pretty close to the end now, but there's still there's still a good chunk left. Pardon me, Eileen. Here we go. Here's our Saint Medallion. So we could go and use this to... Um, Clear that haunting and see if we can uh, pull the doll out of the inventory box, which uh, I do want to test. I do want to check that out. So let's go back real quick. Oh, and you can see little Walter here. Knocking on the door of room 302. Alright. Equip our Saint Medallion. 
stare at the creepy dolls. Wonder what is your world record for Silent Hill 4? Well, I've never had world record in this game. My personal best time uh, for Silent Hill 4 any percent is like 49 minutes? 48 or 49 minutes, something like that. World record is a lot faster than that, though. Forget what current world record is for Silent Hill 4. But yeah, I can speedrun this game in, you know, about 45 to 50 minutes. And then when I do story playthroughs, we did part one on Tuesday. That was nine hours long. And we're currently on part two. And we're almost five hours deep. And I think my longest story playthrough of Silent Hill 4 was like 19 hours. And I used to do these all in one sitting, but now I'm old and aged and it's a lot harder for me to sit down and talk and explain a game for 18 to 20 hours straight. So I try to break it up between streams. The slow run. Okay. Doll haunting is gone, and it does give you back the shabby doll. So let's just keep that with us now. Confirmed that that is a thing. I didn't actually know that. That's cool. So while the haunting is happening, the doll is not in your inventory. But if you clear it and then remove it, it should stop the haunting from happening. Because we saw that it wasn't happening until we put it in the inventory box. Very cool. Let's top up our health here. Let's go, Eileen. Oh yeah, we get another variation of the twin victims here. And uh, feel free to laugh at the name. These are called Bottoms. Because they're basically like the twin victims, but instead of both heads being side by side, one head is uh, sticking out of the butt. It's coming out of its bottom. Get it? drink the ritual the ritual if you read these caution signs you get some weird dialogue soon 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 it will begin very soon now anytime now soon it's starting it's happening any minute now. It's gonna happen. Alright. Time to bolt ahead of Eileen, because Walter is gonna be over here on the side of the fence trying to shoot us. And he's gonna start chasing us through these areas, so we don't need to worry about Eileen following during this part. Cynthia, no.
So here we just kind of want to hurry through. Get a couple extra health things. Walter is in here. If you stick around, he's just off camera there. You can see he chases you down. He'll, he will start attacking and shooting. So you need to be careful. Now we're in Richard Braintree's room. And there's Richard. If you hang out in Richard's room too long, Richard's ghost shows up, starts attacking. Yeah, some really good music here. Dad, Dad. Where's Dad? Hey, Gibla. Welcome. This sound effect that you're hearing, by the way, that sound effect of, like, the woman crying. That part right there, that hoo-hoo. And that part right there. You actually hear that same sound effect reused in Silent Hill Homecoming. Whenever the uh, Siam creatures first appear. The ones that are like uh, a really big, almost closer, swollen arm type creature on the front, but then they have like the small bound woman figure on their back. Those are called Siams in Homecoming, and they, they make this sound when they first introduce them. See if there's any other supplies in here that I might need. I don't think there is. Eh, a lot of extra healing. We're not going to need all this for Walter. Ampule is very nice. There are six chains in the way. I can't open the door. So we need to get into the superintendent's room in order to get Walter's umbilical cord. It's a sketchbook. Walter's father. So those six chains represent six memories of Walter's father that Walter has. And what we're going to need to do is interact with all of these bodies. These are all supposed to represent Walter and those uh, negative memories. So we need to interact with all of these. And there are six of them total. Each time we interact with one, we get a little clip of audio of Walter's father and it breaks one of the chains on Superintendent uh, Sunderland's door. Oh, shut the hell up. You can't blame it all on me. So there's Walter's father's voice. Oh, shut the hell up. You can't put, blame it all on me. So this is Walter's father planning on abandoning Walter immediately after he was born. Blaming Walter's mother, you know, told you we shouldn't have had a baby. So 
wall men here with a first aid kit to bait you in there. Don't need it. Twin victims. Stay down. Stay. Stay. Fall down. Thank you. from Walter's father. Just wants to get out of here. Can't stand it anymore. Shouldn't have had a baby. We're not going to be able to down this ghost. We just got to get this one and go. Super hears him, will be in trouble, so he knows Frank Sunderland will be all in his business. He doesn't like the look of him. And, I mean, to be fair, Frank Sunderland's a very weird guy. He winds up keeping Walter's umbilical cord. But as weird as that is, him keeping it is the only reason we're able to defeat Walter here at the end. always interesting because it doesn't quite match up with the subtitle. They sort of cut it a little too early. It just sounds like it says Little Crybaby even though the subtitle's like Stupid Little Crybaby. Don't know if that was intentional or if that was like a bug. Here's the room with all the fake guns. Don't get to use them. Hurry up. Get packed. And there we go. Those are the six memories that Walter has of his father. And it's just him freaking out, wanting to get out of here. He just wants to... He didn't want Walter. He's nothing but a hindrance to him. And now, the door to Superintendent uh, Sunderland's room is going to be open, and we can go and get the part of Walter's mother's flesh, the umbilical cord that we need, but first, we get a cutscene with Eileen, and there's an interesting aspect to this cutscene, and the next couple of cutscenes, actually. How possessed Eileen is at this point in the game will affect how these cutscenes play out. If she's not very possessed, she will st still very visibly be, like, straining with what's happening to her. She's becoming possessed, she's already been attacked by Walter, but she's like in tune with what's going on. She can feel what Walter's feeling. If she's not very possessed, she'll talk about it as Eileen. If she's a little bit more possessed, she's still Eileen, but she's struggling with it a lot more. 
And if she's fully possessed, she straight up just sounds like young Walter, where she's crying for her mommy and like she just sounds like a little kid. So there's three different variations of this cutscene and the next cutscene after it uh, that can play out depending on how possessed Eileen is at this point in the game. Um, she has some possession level, so we're probably going to get the second of those three options where she's kind of halfway. Uh, she's not as unpossessed as she can be at this point, but she's definitely not full possessed at this point. still has pretty much full control over herself so she's not she's not struggling with that too much so she can kind of explain what's happening but then like here let's just show it for comparison's sake let me pull up the um let me pull up a VOD from one of the other story playthroughs I've done over the years. So you can see what I mean about that cutscene being different. Give me just a moment here. Trying to find like the exact spot in the VOD. Okay, there it is. Let me window capture this. All right. So this is from uh, an in-depth story playthrough that I did, I think, in 2016 or 2017. And... Um, we should see like a different variation of that Eileen cutscene here. Place. It felt like it was placing blame. Eileen? Oh, this might be the same one actually. Came down to the what are the odds of that? Just abandonment. Hurry up, get back. Just get the fuck out. Young version of Nubs, I know. Like five year younger me. Talking about Silent Hill 4 back then. Uh, that is the same cutscene. It just happened to be the same cutscene on that playthrough. Let me find a, uh, a different one. Because I know I've done various playthroughs where I've shown all the different endings and all the variations at some point over the years.
right after new being born. There we go. Knew them really. Outside of those very early memories. Right after new being born. So this is that cutscene if Eileen is fully possessed. This is not a dream. What's happening to this place? So there we go. There is the the VOD for comparison of uh, that cutscene. So we've just seen what happens when Eileen is not very possessed versus what happens when she is completely possessed. And we also got rated right at the end of that there comparison by my good friend Taishi, Tyson Series. Thank you so much for the raid, man. Hope you had a good, good stream tonight. Hope you're doing well, man. Welcome, welcome. We are nearing the very end of a Silent Hill 4 in-depth story playthrough. And I'm showing some uh, comparisons in these last couple of cutscenes, how different they are uh, based on Eileen's possession. So once we pick up this umbilical cord, we get a cutscene. And this one is also different depending on how possessed Eileen is. So we'll watch the two variations that I've got ready. That's pretty good. That's pretty creepy. Her just slowly walking backwards, talking. Eyes are just completely blank, like no blinking, no moving. <laughs> Poorly Moon walks out of apartment. So then we get the umbilical cord. Walter Sullivan's umbilical cord. The superintendent has kept it for years. For some reason. So now... Let's uh, look at that scene it, when Eileen is fully possessed. So these absolutely pretty much the whole second half of the, the shut up me from five years ago or whenever this was. Henry's scared! 
And there you have it. So there is the two cutscenes when uh, when Eileen is fully possessed and when she is not very possessed. There's also a kind of there's a third variation where she has more possession than what she's got on my current playthrough that we're doing but not completely fully possessed the way that she was in that old playthrough. Um, need to turn this down a bit more. There we go. Um, but yeah. Why are the blood textures so pixely? Because it's originally very pixely on a PlayStation 2 game, but um, also because of the way that I'm playing Silent Hill 4 through PS2 emulation. Those textures are, uh, are for whatever reason, just extra pixely. Everything else up reses the way that it's supposed to, but those textures, I haven't figured out why, um, why it's reached that sort of level, why it's doing that. But yeah, it's just part of the emulator graphic settings. This one is the half possessed one. That may be true. Uh, I might be mixing it up. I could have sworn that the halfway possessed one, she's talking about headaches. She's like, oh, my head really hurts. But then she's also talking about how she can feel what Walter, you know, wants to do. So she's talking about Walter, but she's also complaining about her headaches as opposed to this one where she's mostly normal, but then at the very end there, she gets possessed and walks backwards out of the room. But anyway, I don't have all variations all ready to show me. I'm sure I've done it. I've done all endings and all variations on the cutscenes and playthroughs over the last seven years on this channel, so you can look it up. You can look them up and compare. I just don't remember off the top of my head. Quite a cutscene there. We get those little blurry images, glimpses of Walter, of Eileen. If she's completely possessed, use the candle trick to see all three animations. Just reload and use candles. True. That is true. But she's not completely possessed on this playthrough. What's the stuff on the wall? Worms? It's not, not strictly defined. It's just a moving flesh-like texture. Considering all the other themes of this game, think about it. Walter thinks that he was born in room 302. Like that room 302 is literally his mother's womb. So since he believes that, the apartment building as a whole... He's thinking of it as like the inside of a body of his mother. We find a child's drawing. This woman is this Eileen. And it's like a big spiky ball. This is the meat grinder that I was talking about earlier. That's going to be where we fight Walter uh, for the, the final boss fight. And this is what will happen if we don't kill Walter fast enough. 
Eileen will walk into the big spinny wheels of spikes and uh, get murdered. The Event Horizon Gravity Drive. The biblically <laughs> accurate meat grinder. It's it's literally the gravity drive from the Event Horizon. If you've ever seen the movie Event Horizon, which the members of Team Silent who made this game sure did, because uh, they made this thing at the end like literally the same gravity drive. Uh, most likely taking direct inspiration from Event Horizon. bottoms out of my way little Walter all right so we have Walter Sullivan's umbilical cord we just need whatever we're going to use to kill him. I've saved up some guns and bullets. We could very easily do that. Or I could slash him around with a paper cutting knife. Or I could try to bust him up with all these golf clubs. do that. Let's see if we can beat Walter. We can break all of these golf clubs over Walter's head. It's going to be awkward because I'm going to need to save at least one space so that I can hold the, um, the spears. Although, it'll free up a space once I use... The umbilical cord, so that should be fine. A bunch of golf clubs and an umbilical cord. That's all we need for our final boss fight. Let's fucking go. Make a save. <laughs> the golf strats. And Walter's body is gone. Walter's body is gone. Where could it be? In the depression. Wait a minute. This is no normal, normal depression. When I stare into it, I feel like I could be sucked in. It's like it's connected to some other dimension. Or maybe it's like a hole that once you enter, you can never leave. So the game's kind of warning you that this is a point of no return. Once you go through here, that's it. Um, we also see when we're in room 302 of the past, when Joseph Schreiber was living there, um, written on the wall next to the storage room wall area, it says uh, gate to hell, which may have been referring to this. And 
pretty much just like entering all of other all of the other Walter's worlds that he's created. You're born into this one as well. I love this shot of Henry just floating there, like the fetal position. these uh, sort of pillars. It's like frozen in carbonite. Fucking Han Solo. But it's uh, Walter's victims all represented. Here around the walls and then once we go in, all the spears that represent uh, the other eight victims out of the 21 here total. There's the Event Horizon gravity drive. And there is Walter. The big creature is Walter. This Walter with the long hair is just like a, a projection of the real Walter. What he was like when he was alive. And his face textures are freaking out. A little bit of the emulator being kind of janky there. First, Conjurer's Mother's Flesh has to be put onto the Conjurer's true, true body. So we put the umbilical cord up to the god, or up to Walter, the creature. And now one by one, we need to put all eight of these spears... into Walter's body. Eileen is probably not going to survive this because this is going to add quite a lot of time to the fight <laughs> doing it this way. But in exchange... We get to beat Walter with a bunch of golf clubs. Save the girl. We can always reload it. I made a save. We can reload it and go try to show multiple endings.
wish there was a golf club for every victim. I wouldn't even be able to carry all of them. I can't, there isn't that many, and I still can't carry all of them. Okay, all the spears are in. Get up, Walter. It's time for golf. Miss. Spin a Rooney. Dodged a bullet. God, the golf club. Please. No, fuck your spin -rooney. Oh my god, he hit me with the phantom spin -rooney. The hitbox is so fucking ridiculous on that spin attack. Dodged a bullet. Look at it! Look at the attack, it's so stupid. First golf club is broken. Second golf club. He's dead. Don't do it, Eileen. Don't do it. Oh my god, we barely saved her. Even spending all the extra time, we barely still saved Eileen. That's crazy. With the golf clubs. We only managed to break one. It only took one, though. Enjoy the ending.
<laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Guess we'll have to find a new place to live, huh? <laughs> So, uh, that's Silent Hill 4, but definitely some other things, a couple other things we can still show. First of all, that ending credit music people <laughs> mentioning in chat. Sounds like David Bowie, you know, that kind of thing. That is the legend Joe Remersa, who uh, did a lot of the music work on this game with Akira Yamaoka. He's the vocalist for that. He's the vocalist for the ending theme uh, of Silent Hill 3. He, uh, he wrote Room of Angel. New outfits for the ladies. That takes multiple more playthroughs, so I'm not going to be doing that tonight. We'll, we'll, we'll probably do a stream where we unlock all the extra stuff in Silent Hill 4 some other time. Uh, not tonight, though. But I do want to share... Let's 
some amazing work by Joe Remersa. Because Joe Remersa, he's, he's on YouTube. Good old Joe Remersa music. And he made a music video for that song, Cradle of Forest. And you're not prepared for it. Whatever you think Joe Remersa's music video for that song would be, you're not prepared for it. Because this is what it is. Also, this is a full six and a half minute version of the song. So, uh, prepare your bodies for the one, the only, Joe Remersa and his music video for Cradle of Forest. Thank you. 
Yeah, that's right. Joe motherfucking Remersa. Put some respect on his name. He's everything that David Bowie had aspired to be. He wished he could have been like Joe Remersa. Look at that work of art. Look at the things that Joe has created. <laughs> and I love the cameos. You get Mary Elizabeth McGlynn in there. Uh, she sang multiple songs, you know, across the uh, Silent Hill series. She did the intro song, uh, You're Not Here, for Silent Hill 3 and stuff like that. And then uh, you see Akira Yamaoka very briefly. It shows, like, the three of them. And uh, if you saw that moment where it was, like, Joe on one side and Mary McGlynn on the other, and then there's, like, a Japanese guy with sunglasses in between them for a moment, that was footage, and that was Akira Yamaoka. So, amazing, amazing, amazing music video. Absolute work of art. The amazing Joe Remersa. Um, and just for the hell of it, Let's also go ahead and watch one more ending. So we managed to get the good ending, even with an inventory full of golf clubs. And grabbing all the spears one by one. Managed to still beat Walter fast enough and uh, get the best possible ending. We cleared the, the room hauntings and we saved Eileen, so we got the best possible ending. So now we will get a bad ending. It's not the worst ending because we're still going to have our room hauntings cleansed, but we'll see the ending that happens when Eileen dies. We're going to go in with the fucking trusty box cutter. Beat him to death with the box cutter and the bug spray. Box cutter bug spray. And then some healing items. Bug Cutter Box Spray. <laughs> if you're curious as, as to what my favorite Silent Hill games are, how I rank the games, you can do exclamation point faves, F-A-V-E-S. Silent Hill 2 is the easiest to speedrun? No, it is not. Silent Hill 2, at like competitive levels, you have to memorize a fucking RNG chart and start the game like frame perfectly and then also run the game really well using directional controls. Like, two, it's also got some really risky out-of-bounds stuff, some really risky boss fight stuff. Two is definitely not the easiest to speedrun. There's some stuff in two, especially if you're trying to run for, like, world record competition. Two can be rough.
just a little longer now. Receive some wisdom, Walter. So just like before, same thing. We're just gonna take each of the spears. Spear with Holy Mother carved into it. The Crimson Tome says that I have to stick eight of these spears into Walter's body. It even says in the description of the item, in case you're confused about this big monster thing being Walter, the big monster is the actual Walter. It's what's left of him as, uh, as this spirit or ghost. The long hair Walter is just a, proje a projection of what he was like when he was alive. effect of the spears is you can't hurt Walter until you put all eight spears into his real body we're doing this to make Walter mortal to make him killable have to let Eileen die, and we'll see an alternate ending. We'll see one of the bad endings. Since we already saw the best possible ending. So once I get the spears, we're just gonna chill and watch Eileen go down the stairs. Spray some bug spray at Walter in the meantime. You can do it, Eileen. I believe in you. Watch out for the bug spray. Dude, he shot me from so far away. Imagine bullets having range. You still get me from there? God damn. Quit it. Quit it. Don't let her die. We already, we just did the ending where she didn't die. Go watch 20 minutes ago on the VOD. <laughs> Bug spray. Bug spray. Fucking spinaroonies all day. Walter gives no shits. He's almost there. Bullet dodged. Bullet dodged. There she goes. Yeah. 
Box cutter. Box cutter. How do you like that? How do you like that, Walter? Box cutter. Box cutter. <laughs> Ampule. Oh, we stunned him. We stunned him out of the spin rooney Dude, the back dash. His back dash is so powerful. Oh no! He had backdashed into a corner. We could have kept him there. He ran out. Been rooted. It'll take forever with the mighty paper cutter. I think we're making good progress. This is just like Elden Ring. Surprise he doesn't slash. His quick attack slashes. But his charge attack abusable because it's got a lot of iframes on it but sometimes you can avoid taking some hits but see that's what the little wheel at the top is that's my attack charge gauge so whenever that's like fully blinking, like all the way filled up in yellow, I'm doing the hard like charge attack, which is that stab. But if I just tap the button, he does the slash. go. Walter defeated with a box cutter. Enjoy another ending of Silent Hill 4. And that's going to be it for me tonight. So I'll be back after this to say goodnight.
And now the news. Yesterday in Asheville and the woods near Silent Hill, the bodies of five men and women were discovered. The police reported that all the murders appeared to be the work of the same perpetrator. They are continuing their investigation. Four of the victims were found dead at the scene, and the fifth victim, a Miss Eileen Galvin, was transported to St. Jerome's Hospital, where she died a short time later. Police say that Miss Galvin's injuries matched exactly those of the other victims. Eileen. All right. So there we get a bad ending. It sucks because Eileen died, but the uh, the apartment itself was cleansed and Walter was stopped. Henry didn't die, so the 21 sacraments wasn't completed. You still stop Walter, but Eileen's dead and Henry is sad. But thanks, everybody. No, no, Joe. We're going to listen to it right now. Not the whole thing, I guess, but just while I say goodnight. Which, thank you all so much for being here. Everybody who's been hanging out, enjoying the stream, uh, enjoying all of my streams and stuff lately. Really appreciate all the love and support. All the new follows, all the people who just found the channel, welcome in. We have an amazing community here, a lot of nerdy Silent Hill fans, so welcome, welcome, and I definitely still plan on streaming a lot of Silent Hill. Um, I want to still finish up going through all of the series and doing some story playthroughs again over the course of the next several weeks. We'll be getting through all of the games, uh, even stuff like the play novel, uh, the arcade game, uh, PT. I'll be covering everything that I possibly can, doing all this uh, in-depth story playthroughs. I'm still going to be working on speedruns for all of the games. Um, yeah, on top of everything else that's been going on on streams lately. Still going to be playing some Back for Blood with friends, usually on Wednesdays. Going to be playing some Dead by Daylight here and there. Going to be playing uh, Phasmophobia with friends here and there. Um, eventually going to start my stream of Elden Ring. Um, we're going to get back to Death Stranding 100%. Eventually going to stream some Ghostwire Tokyo. Still a lot of stuff planned on top of all the Silent Hill content. So really appreciate everyone being here, supporting me, letting me do what I do. It's all thanks to you guys. So I really appreciate all your love and support. Seriously, could not do this without all of you. And thank you for everyone who's been supporting me over the years. Seriously, I've been doing this for over seven years now, uh, since since 2015. And uh, it's amazing. It's amazing that I can still be doing this. And over 10 years that I've been on Twitch. So, seriously, it's incredible. But yeah, thanks everyone. I really appreciate you all being here, supporting me. 